Okay, um, welcome everybody. I've uh, managed to make it into the London School of Economics today. Um, so we're gonna start with a, um, uh, a lightning round. And as was the case yesterday, um, I will put a timer on for uh, five minutes. And if you need me, to, I'm, I'm controlling the slides. So just say next slide and I'll move the slides on. So I'm not sure who's presenting of this group. Who is it presenting today? It's me. Great, okay. Um, so take it away. And basically, um, Alatia, when, when you hear the, uh, I'm sure you're timing yourself. Yes, you um, I have a finger on the button. <laughs> hear the iPhone sound that is like we're out of time, but I'll make sure each one has a complete five minutes, which, okay, so let's start now. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to kick off today's session with a lightning presentation of our paper, which tackles the question of whether informal redistributive arrangements distort labor supply output and earnings. Next slide. So transfers among kin networks are traditionally understood as reflecting informal risk sharing and being welfare improving. But if transfers within networks are triggered by individuals exerting higher effort and not just triggered by idiosyncratic shocks as featured in efficient risk sharing models, then redistributive arrangements could be distortionary and act as a social tax. This concern that motivates our study is not new and is threaded throughout the development literature since the 1950s, including the potential for these informal arrangements to become a poverty trap. We run our field experiment with full-time factory workers in Cote d'Ivoire, nearly all of whom are women. Their earnings at the factory are based on piece rates for output. So there is a direct mapping between workers' effort and their income. As shown in the figure on the right, redistributive pressure is prevalent in our context with 77% of workers agreeing that income gains from higher effort would lead to more transfer requests. Next slide. Sorry. One challenge for a research question is that lowering the social tax rate on worker earnings could generate opposing income and substitution effects, making it difficult to interpret any observed labor supply responses. The solution we adopt here is to lower the social tax on earning gains only, so reducing the tax rate from tau 1 to tau 2 for effort above E1 in the graph, while keeping the tax rate constant otherwise. Our isolation of substitution effects means that there, if there is a positive social tax, then our intervention should unambiguously increase labor supply. We implement this approach by offering workers a blocked savings account into which earnings increases are automatically transferred. In a second phase, we then randomly vary whether we offer workers a private or a non-private account. In the non-private condition, workers are informed that if they take up the account, members of their social network may receive two publicity text messages that advertise the blocked account product and mention that the worker had successfully saved in their account. This variation allows us to alter the likelihood of transfer requests and isolate redistributive pressure as a necessary mechanism to explain our results. Next slide. So what did we find? The figure on the left shows that when the offered account is private, worker demand for the account is substantially higher at 60% versus 14% for the non-private account. The table on the right shows that workers increase labor supply and effort as a result of being offered the private account. The intent to treat effects are 9% higher attendance and 14.5% higher output and earnings. To give you a sense of this magnitude, the cost of a worker forgoing the account in the non-private treatment arm is equivalent to missing out on 2.3 days of earnings per two week pay cycle. We also find that the, the intervention doesn't lead to workers decreasing the amount they transfer to kin, suggesting that reducing redistributive pressure may be welfare improving on aggregate. Overall, based on the results shown here, and an add-on experiment where we exogenously varied workers' piece rate wages, we estimate the marginal social tax rate to be 26%. Next slide, please. Lastly, we use additional design features to further rule out potential confounds. First, we rule out that our low non-private account take-up is driven by a general desire for privacy unrelated to the social tax. 
In fact, worker acceptance of sending other types of messages to their kin that provided little scope for triggering transfer requests was very high up to 85%. Second, we rule out that our findings are the result of workers who do not receive a private account being unhappy and reducing effort as a result. Third, while worker self-control problems alone can't explain our results, given the difference we find between the private and the non-private accounts, we also conduct a separate test to show that their contribution to our observed treatment effects is minor at best. To conclude, our findings suggest that redistributive pressure can act as a social tax and constitute a barrier to economic development. Tackling its likely underlying cause, the lack of formal consumption smoothing mechanisms and safety nets could improve output and growth. Thank you very much. Well, perfect timing, thank you very much. And just one, one thing, if people, obviously these are too short for, to, to interject, so people, people can stick uh, comments or thoughts in the chat, everyone will get a copy of that, and that's a really useful record. So. Anything you come up, even if it's not a question, just thoughts, ideas, stick that in the chat as we go through the day. Okay, let's move on to the next person, which is, um, so who is presenting this one? I do. Wonderful, thank you. So you have five minutes uh, from now. Okay, thank you. So this study focuses on maize price shock and infrastructure production in children nutrition outcome in Tanzania. So next slide, please. So the motivation uh, of this study actually based from the increased price volatilities and high persist persistent of high starting rate in, in developing countries. So the emerging literature uh, in, uh, that link food prices and child nutrition actually have assumed that the impact of price is homogenous across children irrespective of household, uh, activity like livelihood activity and uh, a few of them have actually attempted to 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 assess how net food and net net seller and net buyer food of food uh moderate the effect of food, of, of price on growth so they they they, they, they uh, 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 however they have uh overlooked the fact that in uh that production food production on its own can have an impact on 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 protective impact on children uh, and a household does not necessarily need to be a net seller of, of food. So in this study, we specifically now tested the impact of maize price shock on the growth of children from households that produce food and households that not produce food. And we also examine the mechanism through which maize price affect the growth of children. Next slide, please. So our data really uh, came from the three rounds of LSM, uh, surveys for Tanzania. So we use this data to construct the uh, growth variable for head for age and food consumption variables for diet diversity and micronutrient consumption. We also constructed calories of maize consumption, which we use as a proxy for low diet diversity in case of Tanzania. So our identification strategy is based on the control function and with IVs control for endogeneity of food production decision. Next slide, please. So broadly, uh, our results show that uh, maize price, high increase in maize price has heterogeneous, heterogeneous impact on the growth of children from pr food producers and the food and producers households. So the impact is negative on children who come from food and producers household, and it is positive on the children from food producers household. But we also find an interesting result that these effects actually differ across age group and, and, and the child gender. So we see the effect is more, uh, is, is more negative at age group 24 to 35 months. Uh, and this age group corresponded to the stage at which most children in, Chanza in Tanzania uh, stop breastfeeding and they start consuming, uh, eating on the same plate with other adults in the household. And we, see that we saw that uh, the effect is negative on female children, indicating an equal treatment of, of children based on gender when the price, uh, when the food becomes scarce in the household. And this result, we, we saw they are in, uh, less sensitive to, to seasonality in production, in agriculture production. And on mechanism, we saw that um, 
Food high increase in, in maize price actually reduces the micronutrient consumption in food non producer household, but it increases consumption of micronutrient in food pro, non food producers household. And the same uh, uh, we saw in the in the case of high uh, diet diversity, where it decreases in food non producers household and increases in food pro, food producers household. But at the same time, we saw that. Food non producers household increase the consumption of energy rich food, while food producers um, decrease the consumption of energy energy rich food. Next slide, please. So, overall, the results suggest that food production offer protective effect on the, on, 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 on on children uh, against against price shocks, and we argue that. Uh, the policy now that could attempt to manage transition from basic feeding to solid food, so to ensure a stable supply of micronutrients when children transit from from basic feeding to to to, to uh, complementary complementary food. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, let us move on to the next person. One second. Okay. So Bryce. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I am Bryce and I am a PhD student at the University of Western Ontario. So uh, I am about to present one of, one of our work titled The Long Term Effect of Colonization in Africa on Trust to Our Local Leaders. Next, please. So this paper tries to answer whether English colonization has a persistent effect on trust to our local leaders and examines one of the channels through which this effect could be possible. So going back in the history, the colonial practices, British and French differ on three dimensions identified as important in the literature. First, the legal system, common versus uh, civil law. Uh, second, the nature of colonial rule, direct versus indirect. And third, the labor policy, pay versus force. Next, please. So the identification strategy I use in this paper is the regression discontinuity design. I undertake a regression discontinuity analysis on a limited set of respondents who reside near national borders between Anglophone and Francophone countries. So I only consider West African countries that have at least one Anglophone and Francophone borders as shown on the figure. Countries shadowed in blue are Francophone countries and in red are Anglophone countries. The data that I use are individual data from Afrobarometer survey round six and seven. I have undertook several regression analysis where the control variable at, at individual levels, ethnicity levels and country levels, taking also into account the distance to the coast and the distance to the capital city. So the main result in this session is that uh, the level of trust of local leaders is higher among Anglophone respondents by at least 12% and are all significant. Next, please. So this, despite the inclusion of several controls, there may still be indigenity concern due to possible confounding factors that are difficult to control. So in order to, to alleviate these indigenity problems, I repeated uh, the same analysis on Cameroon, which includes region colonized by both British and French, and I explored the natural experiment provided by the Anglophone Francophone borders as shown in the figure. So the case of Cameroon is a useful setting for the regression discontinuity analysis because prior to the English and French colonization in 1919, the whole country was colonized by Germans in 1884. And after the independence in 1960, the two parts of Cameroon reunited in 1961. And despite the strong policy of centralization, they retained separate legal and education system and a strong attachment to the language and culture of their respective colonizers. So for the case of Cameroon, we still find a similar result as in Western Africa sample. So take away, although the ability of Next slide, please. Yeah, the takeaway from, from this study is that although the ability of, to identify causal mechan me uh, mechanism for these differences is limited, the evidence suggests that their differences are not due to soft legacies associated with religion and education system, but rather to the hard legacy, including the lack of forced labor and the 
and that it will give British colonies more vital local level institutions because the form of traditional ruling style had not been banned by the British nature. In contrast, the French colonization changed the African culture because the main goal was to turn the colony into French states. Thank you for listening. Question and comment are welcome. Thank you very much, Bryce. Um, it, it, it'd be good if people just introduce themselves in a couple of slides like Bryce, sorry, in a couple of words like Bryce did, just so we know who's uh, talking, but that's, that's really interesting. Thank you very much. So we'll move to the next person. So it looks like is it Paul presenting this one. Yep. Thanks, Robin. Uh, I'm Paul Gertler from UC Berkeley. This is joint work with Laura Kyoto, David Contreras, and Dana Carney, who are also colleagues here at Berkeley. Uh, this, pay, this is uh, Making Entrepreneurs Returns to Training Youth in Hard versus Soft Business Skills. Uh, next, Robin, please. Um, the motivation for this paper comes from the recognition that uh, small and medium enterprises form the backbone of the African economy. 90% of businesses that employ about uh, two thirds of all workers contribute 40% to, uh, to national income. And there's been a lot of investment on the part of governments and international agency in the production function of high quality entrepreneurs well recognized as a key policy priority. Uh, in particular, governments invest about a billion dollars annually in terms of training and other activities to increase the stock of entrepreneurial skills. And despite the popularity of uh, these interventions, uh, the, um, the rigorous evidence for traditional business training has been very disappointing. Uh, traditional skills training existing entrepreneurs don't yield much in terms of productivity and profitability. Uh, there are some results on encouraging an entrepreneurial mindset in some uh, context. And this entrepreneurial mindset is associated with so-called soft inter and intrapersonal skills. Next, please. Um, so this is a intervention uh, about can we train entrepreneurs that our intervention we uh, called Skills for Effective Development or SEED. And it's a high quality in residence three week uh, mini MBA. So you go to the school, you're housed there and you eat, breathe and drink uh, entrepreneurship training. Um, and it's different than lots of other entrepreneurial training programs, not just because it's an in residence intensive program, but it targets youth before the onset of their economic life. So these are high school graduates in April, and they take this course in May, right before they go on uh, and start working or go on to uh, university. Uh, it's in Uganda. We have a large nationally representative sample of over 4,000 recent high school graduates age 17 to 19. Uh, we randomly sampled 200 of the secondary schools out of the 700 and then uh, recruit from those schools and randomly assign to two curricula. One is a hard skills curricula. So that's 75% training them in finance, accounting, personnel management, uh, all of the traditional MBA skills and 25% in soft skills, negotiation, persuasion, self-control, communication, and things like that. And then we have a second arm, which uh, reversed the, the percentages. And the idea was to get some experimental variation in the two types of skills, traditional versus these intra and interpersonal skills that the literature and the industry uh, say are critical to management. In fact, yesterday or this week in the New York Times, uh, uh, that released a study and interview of uh, CEOs and CEO um, ad, uh, position advertisements identified these soft skills as to uh, what uh, businesses are looking to hire individuals in. Uh, we're going to report some results from uh, close to four years after the training was completed. So it's not a one-year follow-up, but a three-and-a-half-year follow-up. 
and we're about to go into the field for an eight-year follow-up. Next, Robin. Okay, these are um, some effects. Uh, these are on skills. These are three and a half years later. Uh, the panel on the left called skills is measured in standard deviations and negotiation outcomes is measured in uh, percent differences. These are treatment effects. The blue dots are the hard skills treatment. The red dots are the soft skills treatment. And you can see uh, both trainings dramatically increased uh, skills from hard skills knowledge, plasticity and stabilities, which are aggregations of the big five, reduced stress, self-equity equity and persuasion. The right panel, we ran a lab in the field where the um, interviewee, the study participant negotiated uh, against the um, interviewer. And here the soft skills treatment uh, led to significant improvements in bargaining outcomes or negotiation outcomes, but the hard skills didn't. Next. Good time is up, Paul. All right, so I'll just say that these resulted in dramatic improvements in business outcomes in terms of business starts, uh, earnings, uh, and number of employees, and stop there. Brilliant, thank you very much. Thanks, Robin. Really interesting. Um, so let's go on to the next person. So who of this group is presenting? Hi, Robin, that, that's me, Simon. Hi, Simon. Okay, hi everyone. I'm, I'm Simon Franklin from, from Queen Mary University. Um, this paper is about urban public works and their equilibrium effects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, we think it's, it's very important to estimate the indirect effect of any kind of anti-poverty or social programs, as well as the direct effects. Um, but it's very challenging to, to uh, estimate those, those types of effects, even though they might be, be, be very important. Um, so, for example, we might think of effects on labor markets or on prices due, due to these kinds of programs. What I'm going to focus on today is the part of our paper that looks at the equilibrium labor market effects of a public works program in Ethiopia. Now, the standard state-of-the-art method of doing this in development economics would be to randomize a program at scale and then compare market outcomes, wages, between treated geographies and untreated geographies and get an estimate that way. Now, this we believe is problematic if the effects could spill over from treated to untreated areas in very complex ways. Um, and that's going to lead to a number of problems. Firstly, it's going to lead to downward biased estimates, and it's also going to miss important welfare gains to control areas. Uh, but parameterizing those interactions, we think, is a very, very challenging thing. Uh, and so what we're going to do and what is our, our main contribution is to bring one of the spatial structural models from the urban economics literature to a randomized control trial of a program at scale uh, to get at this problem. Next slide, please. Uh, our end goal is a, compre a comprehensive evaluation of Ethiopia's um, urban public safety net program. We worked with the government to randomize the rollout across the city, across geographies in the city, um, and we collected very rich primary survey data. The key feature there is that we have commuting data and wages at the individual level, which is going to do us, allow us to do a lot of, a lot of quite uh, interesting things. We firstly document that the program has very large and positive effects on public amenities, public goods in places where it is rolled out. And it also reduces labor supply to the private sector amongst beneficiaries and therefore induces a large negative labor supply shock. What the model is going to do is allow us to look at what the effect of that labor supply shock then is on equilibrium wages across the entire city using the structure that it provides. And it's also going to allow us to then quantify the welfare effects of the program, bringing together all the different myriad effects that the program can have. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna skip through the data and, and how we estimate the direct effects and just jump into the spillovers immediately. Now, the standard approach would say that we should regress wages um, of people living in a place I, a location I, on whether that location is treated. Okay, that would be the standard way to do it. What our model tells us is that we need to do something quite different in the second and third equations. We need to regress wages in destination labor markets, J, on how much those labor markets are exposed to the program, which is going to be a function of commuting flows using our rich commuting data, and then the randomized treatment status of, of people who could potentially commute into that labor market. Uh, and without going into further detail, that's what we're exactly what we're going to do. Next slide, please. 
So these are the results. The first column shows that kind of naive, more traditional uh, reduced form estimate. And the second column is the reduced form that comes out of our structural model. What you see is that we get uh, an estimate that is twice as large per unit of, of, of treatment or exposure to the program when we take into account the potential spillovers across locations with the commuting data. Indeed, we find that wages increase by 15% in treated areas, but also by more than 3% in control areas once we quantify these things. Next and final slide. So I won't show you the full expression for welfare that we get out of the model. I don't have time. So I'll just summarize what, what we get from that. Uh, firstly, these equilibrium effects are very large. Um, in partial rollout, they're similar to the direct effects of the program in treated areas, but then of course there are additional benefits to control areas. And then when we simulate the full rollout of the program at scale, those equilibrium effects are further magnified because the intensity of treatment across the entire city is magnified as well. And so when we do that, the equilibrium um, effects are much larger than the direct effects. We can also then benchmark this against a simulation of, of, a, of a program that just gives cash and therefore has larger direct effects because there's no work requirement. However, that, that result is reversed when we take into account the labor market effects because they're so large that actually um, lead to much larger welfare gains from, from public works than, than a simulated cash transfer. And so I'll end there and, and say maybe that's some good news um, on public works programs in urban contexts. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so uh, who's presenting this one? Karen? Uh, that, yeah, that would be me. Hey, hey Taryn. Hi. Great. Okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Taryn Dinkelman. I'm at the University of Notre Dame, uh, and I'm very happy to share some new work that I've been uh, busy with, um, Rachel Nagai at the LSE, looking at time use and gender in Africa. Next slide, please. So we start, the paper kind of starts with this recognition that through the process of economic development, time reallocation um, is central to this process, time, both time reallocation from home into the market and time reallocation of workers across market sectors. Um, and so you can see in this picture here, we're using data from the Groningen uh, Growth and Data Center to show a measure of um, shifts in female employment in African countries over the last 50 years. And you can see that workers, as countries get richer within Africa, workers shift out of agriculture and female workers shift largely into services. So this reallocation process, uh, particularly for women through the structural transformation has been really well documented in rich countries like the US um, and in many European countries. But we know really little about how African women are spending their time and have been spending their time in home and market and across different market sectors. So what this paper is about, um, it's, it starts uh, essentially as a descriptive piece where we bring some old data and some new data to bear to describe some of the pattern, patterns and how African women are spending their time. And we use those patterns to highlight some of the frictions that women may face that might slow down a shift in their time from the home to the market and across market sectors as economies change. And then the second part of the paper, which I won't talk about today, uh, discusses some of the recent empirical evidence that, that might help alleviate some of the frictions. Next slide, please. So first of all, we start off documenting some uh, interesting patterns on the intensive and extensive margins of work for African women. On the left-hand side, we have the female labor force participation rate uh, at different levels of GDP per capita for African countries. And on the right-hand side, we've used time use survey data to look at the, to document the average time that women are spending in market and home work in the countries for which we have data. And so there are a few things that jump out of these, uh, these figures. The first thing is that there's tremendous heterogeneity in female labor force participation rates across countries. Uh, some African countries have some of the highest participation rates in the world. Others have some of the lowest participation rates in the world. The second thing that jumps out is the, from the figure on the right is that even in countries that have very high female labor force participation rates, market hours on average are pretty low. And those same women who are doing low market work are doing a, a large amount of home production uh, hours. So the big gap, the red dots are home production and the green dots are, are market production. Next slide, please. So we use uh, some of the patterns on the intensive and extensive margin to, as I said, highlight some of the frictions that women may face in moving their time around. Um, and starting on the extensive margin, the two graphs here show us strong regional variation in both the female employment levels and also the composition of work. 
So first off, the, th the first thing to notice is in North Africa, female labor force participation is really, really low. Um, and so we talk about work that emphasizes the role of social norms in preventing women from working outside the home, contributing to that difference. On the right, on the left-hand side, you see the composition of market work uh, for women in sub-Saharan Africa is really concentrated among contributing family workers and own account workers. A lot of these are family farms. And the key thing about family farms is that they facilitate combination of home and mar market production in the same place. This pattern actually resembles historically the pattern of women's work in the US in the early 1900s. Next slide, please. We also look at constraints that may operate on the intensive margin of work by focusing on um, home production, how women are using their time in home production. And we use data from time use diaries or time use surveys for African countries uh, that we can actually, um, we can uh, access. And we break up the composition of uh, work in home production across these different categories. And two key patterns emerge from, from looking at this table. The first is that home production is basically a full-time job, wherever you are and whichever decade you wanna look at, between 40 and 52 hours of work are spent um, in home production. Secondly, the composition of home production in a lot of African countries really resembles the composition of home production in the US in the 1920s. So the majority of women's time in a lot of these African countries is spent on cooking and cleaning. And that was basically what women were doing in the US in the 1920s. And so there are you know, obviously many reasons for that. Two of the ones we highlight are first, lack of access to um, home production technologies that make home production more efficient. And secondly, potentially a lack of market substitutes for doing those, the, those jobs um, in the market. So we end the paper by talking about, well, in my presentation by saying, labor markets in Africa are shifting, they're shifting for women. And we talk about, uh, we review the empirical evidence and policies that address these barriers in our paper. If you are working in this area, send me an email. If we don't cite you in the paper, we would love to um, uh, you know, cite work uh, that potentially addresses the, the frictions to women moving their time into the labor market. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you so much, Taryn. Um, so I think so it's a lightning round, so we have to move on like lightning. So who, who is presenting this next paper on? That would be me. Wonderful, thanks. All right, great. Uh, I'm Gianmarco Leon Chiliota from UPF and Barcelona GSC, and this is a joint project with Erika de Serrano, Stefano Caria, and Philippe Castrao. Next. Uh, so the motivation for this paper starts from the observation that organizations in both the public and the private sector are divided into multiple and hierarchical layers, okay? Uh, this means that the effort of workers in the different layers are going to contribute to the production of final output. Workers are ineffective without a good manager, and on the other hand, the effort of managers can only pay off if workers are motivated enough, okay? So, what this gives rise to is a problem of, of the optimal incentive allocation in multi-layered organizations. The question that we are going to ask in this paper is how should incentives be divided among the different layers of an organization? Next, please. We're going to provide here experimental evidence coming uh, from, from a collaboration that we've uh, been carrying out for the past few years with a large public sector organization, the Community Health Worker Program in Sierra Leone, which is organized into teams, and each team has several layers. On the one hand, you have the frontline health workers, the community health workers who are in charge of providing basic health services to the community with a strong focus on uh, maternal, maternal and, and child health. Uh, these guys are based in their own communities and are part-time government employees who are paid uh, a fixed monthly rate of 150,000 leons. On top of them, you have supervisors who supervise on average between eight and 15 workers, and their role is to enable health workers by training and advising them. These guys are also part-time employees earning 250,000 uh, Sierra Leonean leons. Uh, next. Um, what we do in this experiment is to introduce a pay for performance scheme that is going to reward workers with 2,000 leons for each uh, piece of output that they produce. The piece of output here is a health visit that the worker provides uh, to the house of the, of the workers. And, and we're going to introduce experimental variation at the team level on who is the recipient of this piece rate. On the one hand, we, ha we have a treatment arm where the workers only are, are receiving the piece rate. On the other hand, we have the supervisors only, and the third treatment arm is going to be a shared incentive in, in which uh, both the worker and the supervisor are going to receive a thousand leons for each service provider.
Next. In the paper, we have a simple model of service provision where output is a product of, of the joint effort of the worker and the supervisor. And we have uh, a, a term that, that determines the, the uh, strategic complementarity of the effort of the supervisor and the, um, and the work. Uh, in this setting, we're going to allow the supervisor to provide site, uh, incentives to workers through site, site payments, okay? The optimal contract, meaning the way in which the organization is going to determine what proportion of the peace rate incentives is going to go to the worker or to the supervisor is going to be a function of two key parameters. On the one hand, we're going to have the effort complementarity in the production function that you can see in this slide. And the other, on the other hand, we're going to have uh, contractual frictions, meaning uh, if the supervisor wants to make a side payment to the worker to incentivize her, she's going to have to pay a cost that is above uh, what, what the worker receives. And the higher the contractual frictions that we observe, uh, you're going to be limiting the scope for quotient bargaining. Next. All right, let me jump straight to the main results of, of the paper. What we first uh, derive experimental uh, estimates of, of our treatment effects, and we find that both uh, in, in all treatment arms, you increase the number of visits, meaning if you pay uh, either workers or supervisors for, for more services, they do provide more, more services. However, one-sided incentives, meaning worker or supervisor receiving the peace rates, increase visits by 41%. On the other hand, shared incentives cause a 61% increase in, in output. We then go uh, back and structurally estimate uh, our model of service provision and show that the, the experimental results are explained by two key parameters. First, the strong complementarity between worker and supervisor effort, such that incentivizing one layer only is inefficient. And second, that there are large contractual frictions, which are going to limit redistribution of the incentives through site payments and reduce the effectiveness of incentives only to the top layer. We're going to find a corroborating evidence of complementarities and frictions through heterogeneities and mediation analysis in that reduced form. The structural model tells us that the optimal incentive structure is very close to what we estimate, uh, what, what we implement in the shared incentives. It's up at 0.56 and the complementarity is rises returns to worker effort by 20%. And I'm going to stop here. Sorry, I went 15 seconds above. Fantastic, thank you so much. That's really interesting. Um, sorry, the thing's going straight. Sure. Um, so let's move to the next, um, sorry. Uh, who's presenting the next um, uh, paper? Uh, it's me. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Augustin Bergeron. I'm uh, finished. I finished my PhD at Harvard, and I'm now a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford. And today, I'm going to talk about the optimal assignment of bureaucrats on evidence from randomly assigned tax collectors in the DRC. Next, please. So the motivation for this project is that there's a large literature that has uh, discussed that the assignment of workers to tasks and teams is an important margin through which firms can raise productivity. Uh, and this dimension is likely to also be important in the public sector due to constraints on raising funds to uh, institutions. To investigate this question, uh, we uh, designed a field experiment in, part in partnership with the provincial government in the Democratic Republic of the Congo that randomly assigned tax collectors to posting and teams. This was done in the context of a property tax campaign uh, run in 2018, where tax collectors registered properties and made door-to-door -door tax appeals. The randomization was done in two steps. Uh, every single month, tax collectors were randomly assigned to a teammate and the teams were randomly assigned to collect in two neighborhoods. So in total, 35 tax collectors were involved in 184 neighborhoods, and that's about 20,000 properties in our sample. The data comes from uh, administrative database for tax compliance and revenue and survey data for other outcomes. And overall, what we're interested in answering is whether the government can improve collectors' uh, assignment and increase uh, tax revenue. Next slide. So for this, uh, we introduced an empirical framework where we define uh, two types, household and collector type. Household type, uh, either low or high, comes from baseline ability to pay that is reported for every single property owners in the city 
by a third party, which is essentially the neighborhood cheat, so a local elite. Collector types uh, are defined as low or high, uh, but because we don't have information about the performance of tax collector at baseline, it's going to come from the average collector compliance across uh, neighborhoods. And armed with those two types, we can define the optimal assignment as the distribution of type that maximize tax compliance subject to two status quo allocation constraints. The first constraint is essentially that every single property or neighborhood is only visited by one pair of tax collector. The second constraint is that the a workload for each type of tax collector, low or high, is the same distribution of work, is the same workload as under the status quo assignment. Uh, next slide, please. So how does the optimal assignment look like? That's the, the distribution of, of types is on the figure on the top right. And we find evidence of positive assortative matching. So it's shown in blue. In other words, we find that the government should assign high type tax collectors to other high type collectors and low type uh, to other low types. It should also assign high high type uh, teams to high type neighborhoods and low low type teams to low type neighborhoods. We then, then turn to quantifying uh, the increase in tax compliance under this optimal assignment. And that's shown in the bar uh, chart at the bottom right. And we see that implementing the optimal assignment would increase tax compliance by 37% relative to the status quo assignment. We can also break down this increase in compliance under the optimal assignment by looking at the collector to collector dimension of the assignment or the collector to household uh, dimension of the assignment. And we find that they contribute roughly equally. So that's the two middle uh, uh, bars uh, at the bottom here. Next slide, please. So why is it that the, that the optimal assignment uh, implies positive assortative matching? Uh, and why are there complementarities in collector to collector and collector to households? Uh, when we look at mechanism, we find evidence that this is partly explained by high, high type collectors team exerting more effort and, and doing more visits uh, towards uh, high type properties. So that's what we call conditional effort. We also evident, find evidence of skill transmission that are disproportionately present for high type tax collectors. They're better at transmitting skills and they're better at learning skills from each other. We rule out that the effect is explained by a citizen sign explanation, which is that uh, collectors are, are more convincing uh, when uh, two uh, high type collectors are present. Finally, we look at other downsides uh, of the uh, optimal assignment by using survey data. And we do find evidence of a small increase in bribe payments under the optimal assignment, but it's about a quarter of the size of the increase in tax revenue. And we don't find evidence of backfiring on other margins, such as payment of other taxes or view of the government. Lastly, we look at the distributional impact of implementing the optimal assignment. And we do find evidence uh, that it improves the, dist the distributional impact by having larger effects on compliance for wealthier property owners. So to summarize, our paper suggests that improve, uh, improving public sector employees assignment uh, could be an, imp an important margin for revenue mobilization uh, in resource constrained settings. Uh, thanks everyone for that. Uh, Brilliant, thank you very much, Augustine. Um, we will keep going. Um, so Idosu, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. My name is Ido Sumaris Adam, and I'm from I'm a PhD student from University de Montréal. I'm going to present my first project on time delays at the border, macroeconomic consequences for African economies. Next slide, please. Delay at border is one of the important problems firms are facing in Africa. For example, in the business year in 2018, a Nigerian uh, businessman reported as a manufacturer one of our biggest headaches is with the supply chain. We have a situation where we have to order materials three months or six months ahead because of clearing delays. So using, the, uh, using data from the uh, World Bank Enterprise Survey, I find that the uh, proportion of imported inputs in Sub-Saharan Africa is quite large, ranging from 14% to 63%, with an average of 40% around. However, it takes a long time to clear input through customs in sub-Saharan African countries. For comparison, uh, the average delay range for, from four to 33 days, with in some, certain cases, it can amount over three months, while in countries like Germany, Ireland, or Greece, the average border delay ranges only for three days to uh, uh, seven days. <clears throat> 
The question is, how do border delay affect economic development? In the literature, this question has been tackled from the perspective of international trade. In this paper, I show that the border delay can relate to the supply capacity of firms within the economy. Next slide, please. My framework is one of competitive firms supplying a homogeneous goods using labor and a CS aggregation of local and foreign inputs. While local input motion is standard, the foreign input motion is subject to, to stochastic border delay here Z. When Z equal to one, the inputs are, delay, uh, are delivered on time and can participate timely. Uh, to production, but when Z equals zero, it means that input has been delayed at border, and then new investment just adds to pending order. Importantly, in my framework, heterogeneity arises only because firms have different experience of the same border process, uh, border delay process. The second part of the framework is a household problem, which is standard. Next slide, please. Working on uh, this, I find some analytical results. If the discounting factor is less than one, which is the case generally, the net present value of an investment is lower when it is applied to border delays than when it is not. Second, the more likely the delays, the less the net present value of an investment. Third, the net present value is increasing in the discounting factor, so decreasing in the interest rates. And fourth, the optimum local input is lower under the delivery delay if local and foreign input are complement and higher if they are substitute. And last, if the discounting factor is one, then border delays don't matter whatever the distribution of probability is. Next slide, please. When I solve the model and calibrate it to uh, the real economy uh, data, I find that in the short run, firm can develop a strategy to self-ensure against the input uh, disruption risk by building buffer, input buffer. But in the long run, the effective uh, input disruption amount to uh, negatively impact the economy. When I hypothetically shut down the delays, I find that the effect on production will be as high as 20% for Cameroon economy and consumption would be 40%. And this effect rises from the increase that we have directly from uh, uh, input, foreign input that would increase by more than 42%. And the effect splits over to local input and labor input due to complementarity between inputs. Next slide. So to just, okay. To just conclude, I will say that I show in this paper that the border delays can effectively affect the uh, supply capacity of firm within the economy. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much. Um, we will keep going. Who is presenting this paper? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so this paper, it, uh, in this paper, we look at um, the social norms and task compliance in an informal economic setting, um, Nigeria. So next slide. So the motivation for uh, the study is uh, the um, observed revenue problem in Nigeria, which is uh, the largest economy in Africa, also having the largest population but also among the country with the lowest tax revenue and also uh, lowest tax compliance. And this is what we show in uh, figure one and figure two, where you could see that um, even among comparable countries, Nigeria is among the, one of the worst uh, tax to GDP ratio. And when you look at tax uh, income tax uh, uh, in the country, it's uh, in terms of the trend, it's still less than uh, $3 billion per annum. So um, one of the reasons for this uh, low compliance is the high level of informality within the economy. And um, the problem with conventional economic incentive uh, is present in the informal economy sector. So how do we generate or how do we mobilize um, or improve tax compliance uh, in such a settings? And that's uh, the key objective of this study. So we look at around how uh, we can use the influence of behavioral insight around social influence and social norms to enhance voluntary uh, compliance. Next slide. 
So we uh, so uh, we look at four kind of treatment in the in our experiment. Um, first is uh, the full information uh, treatment, whereby uh, the informal sector workers that we work with um, we group them into a group of three and five, and in these groups we expose them to information about the other members of their group in terms of people that are uh, compliant and those that are not uh, compliant with the tax laws in terms of how much they are paying and, and the rest of information about their peers. In the second treatment, we look at, um, uh, we only expose partial information about the highest taxpayer in each group. And in the third treatment, we look at um, uh, only uh, the tax defaulters that has actually experienced a punishment for defaulting on taxes in each group. So uh, two were relating to partial information and one full information. And in the top proposition, we try to look at differences between third and the uh, uh, between the small and the large groups in terms of how much uh, behavior differences in between these two groups. How we just uh, next slide. So in this slide, we just uh, give an insight into about what, what, what we found. And as, as you can see, the green line is um, in tre treatment with full information. Uh, the red line is the control group whereby there is uh, no information shared. And the two, uh, the yellow and the black lines are the two partial information that I mentioned earlier. So uh, in terms of um, providing full of information, it's actually worse off than not providing even information at all. So when, you, when we provide full information, we, we have the worst outcome in terms of task compliance. But um, between uh, partial information, that uh, was able to do relatively better. I mean, in terms of uh, exposing good uh, task compliance or default tasks that have been punished, uh, it's really also better than full information and also in uh, uh, than the control group of no information. But this information is uh, very sensitive to key, two key parameters, ability of taxpayer to know about information, uh, uh, whether they have faced tax before and uh, whether they know about the tax system and how it was. So people that have paid tax before or know about tax system, actually, they are more likely to uh, 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 default on, on, uh, or not uh, be task compliant in, in, in our studies. So the implications for this for policymakers is that um, information or social norms can uh, be effective, but actually um, we have to be sensitive in because the kind of information matters. Um, when we have two, uh, like in the full information treatment, it actually uh, uh, provide uh, a kind of worst off result. And the last in terms of uh, between small and uh, large group, we actually did not find any uh, major difference in compliance between this group, which means that um, maybe in our study, we, it's not large enough to have uh, a, a effect in terms of effect size of information on compliance. So thank you. Brilliant. Well, thank you, everyone. That was absolutely amazing. I, I first saw this format uh, in the MBR and before that wouldn't have believed that it worked, but you get so much information across in five minutes. So thank you, everyone. We have about a six minute break and then uh, we will uh, come back for the longer presentations. But thank you so much for all the presenters and everybody for showing up uh, and we'll see you in six minutes. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, Benedetta. This is Tiffany. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I just wanted to check. I was saying your name right. Come again? I was just checking that I was saying your name right. And I'm yeah, yeah, you are. Back. You're saying it great. Good. <laughs> I'm looking forward to your talk. Um, I'm using multiple screens, so it looks weird. So I was like, let me just change the screens around. <laughs> I have a million timers instead, so I hope that none of them is going to be disruptive. Hopefully they're all on silent. I think it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Should we start, Robin? Tony, let's go, yeah. All right, let's do it. Hi, everyone, welcome to Bread this, I was gonna say this afternoon, for some of us this afternoon on a very, very rainy, pouring East Coast. I hope everybody is staying indoors as much as they can if you're on the East Coast. Uh, the talk coming up is uh, Benedetta. We're really glad to have her here talking about quantifying externalities and technology adoption, evidence from Uganda. Benedetta, the floor is yours. I will. Check Q&A and chat for questions, Benedetta, and might interrupt you from time to time if there's clarifying questions. Otherwise, we'll take some at the end. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen, and hopefully you can see it OK. Yeah, so I'm super excited to have the opportunity to uh, talk about my work on measuring externalities in technology adoption. Um, studying the decisions by, made by uh, farmers in, in Uganda. So the bird's eye view for this project is that technology adoption generates externalities. Externalities can uh, generate a social benefit or social harm. Now, when a government is presented with a technology that has externalities, um, typically it would need to decide a couple of things. So the first is deciding whether to intervene. So in order to make this decision that the government will sort of value the social benefit or the social harm that the externalities are, are generating and decide, is this large enough that it grants um, government intervention? In order to do that, one key piece of information that the government needs, it's sort of the monetary value of externalities. And this is hard to measure because externalities are not sold on the market. They don't have a price tag. Another thing that governments uh, want, to, want to look at when presented with technologies with externalities is deciding how to intervene. So let's say a technology you know, is um, important, the externalities are large enough that I want to do something as a government, what should I do? Well, the optimal policy is the one that maximizes the social benefit or makes, minimizes the social harm in this case, but um, the um, type of benefit harm that is generated will depend on how the externalities and by whom these externalities are being generated. And this can be demanding. Um, it may create a lot of data, it may um, require a lot of data, or it may require the government to experiment. Um, it's cumbersome. So in my, um, my project today, I'd like to um, discuss with you this experiment that I ran that um, helps 
um, in two directions. One, to measure the externalities of uh, technology adoption, and second, to identify their source in order to allow the governments to uh, pinpoint what's the optimal, what's the optimal policy. The um, technology that I'll be studying in this case is uh, um, a technology with positive externalities uh, in the domain of agriculture. So specifically, um, an agricultural pest control practices in Uganda, um, a country that's definitely come up a few times in the presentations before. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. Um, so positive externalities are um, particularly important for economic development because um, when with positive externalities, agents do not internalize the benefit of their action uh, on others, of their of their own adoption on others. And so this, in a standard Pigouvian argument, will generate lower adoption in equilibrium than what would be socially optimal. And now this is interesting, especially in the agricultural context and especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, because it may help explain the low rates of, of technology adoption um, in this part of the world. So the um, questions that I will be asking and hopefully giving an answer to are twofold. So first, uh, what's the monetary value of externalities? In order to answer this question, I will use a known technique in a novel way. So I will be taking um, the, the Becker de Groot Marshak mechanism to elicit willingness to pay, and I will use it to value the externalities. The, the novelty here is that while usually the Becker de Groot Marshak is used to value goods and services for your own treatment, in the case that, I, um, that I'm using it, um, I use it to value uh, treating someone else, inducing someone else to take an action that's beneficial for me. Then the second uh, question that I'm gonna ask is, what's the source of the externalities? And here I will generate random variation in two types of externality sources. So the first one is contagion externalities. They materialize when a farmer adopts a pest control technology. And so she reduces the pest population in her environment. And so the infection risk for others goes down. So this is a sort of a, a Miguel and Kramer worms argument. And the second type of externalities is knowledge externalities. So when a farmer adopts a pest control technology, um, other farmers can learn. Uh, from the adopting farmer through conversation, by observation, and the the seminal paper sort of in this in this literature is the Foster Rosen spike from 1995. But in general, there's a wide literature on social learning and knowledge spilling over from farmer to farmer. Um, the way in which I will carry out my um, my estimation is to run a field experiment in 103 villages in Uganda, and I will offer um, the uh, farmers a training on pest control technologies. So you should see this training of pest control technology as sort of like a, a, a technology bundle uh, that people can, uh, uh, can receive. And I will elicit farmers' willingness to pay for themselves uh, to receive the training. Uh, we'll call it W. And I will elicit farmers' willingness to pay for one other farmer to access the program. So this element, which is uh, one of the main novelties of my project, is what allows to measure the monetary value of externalities. Because how much I'm willing to pay for you, to induce you to adopt this technology, is a measure of how much I estimate on net benefiting from your adoption. And then I will generate random variation in the two types of externalities I told you, so in contagion and in knowledge externalities. And my goal is to look at how a change, uh, um, an exogenous change in the externalities then changes farmers' willingness to pay for another farmer to receive the training. So I will identify what's the, how much the source of externality matters and affects the total size um, of the externalities that farmers um, reveal. Um, a quick preview on my findings is that, so first and foremost, externalities are large 
and they're heterogeneous. So um, by large, I mean a farmer is willing to pay about two days wage um, to induce another farmer to adopt. And also farmers are willing to pay uh, for others, but this willingness to pay for others is not uniform. Uh, farmers are willing to pay different sums for different people, which bears the question, you know, why is, why is that happening? And so this is, brings me to in, uh, investigate the source of the externalities and what I will find is that there is indeed a positive correlation between, um, the, uh, between externalities and willingness to pay in that lower contagion externalities that I experimentally saw will decrease the willingness to pay for others, as we would expect, and then increasing knowledge externalities increases the willingness to pay for others. Now, the learning points from this are that the optimal policy is nuanced. So while on the one hand, the program is costly, um, and so we uh, it would not be efficient to and optimal to treat every farmer, but still the externalities are so large that we want to, we still want to train someone. Um, and so who should we train? In my results are going to show that who should we train really does matters. And of course, the optimal policy will target the farmers that generate the highest externalities. And the methodology that I apply allows us to, invest, uh, to investigate and identify who are these people for uh, optimal targeting of the policy. In what follows, let me give you just super quickly um, some information about the setting. And then I'll spend most of the talk today on design. Um, and hopefully I'll have the time to go through uh, all, of the, uh, all of the results. So I'll get, uh, I'll get on it. Um, the pest control technologies that I study are pest control technologies that um, target a specific pest. It's called the fall armyworm. The fall armyworm is a very destructive and infectious new pest that arrived in Africa just um, 20, in 2016 in Uganda in 2017. It's a, for this reason, I talk about it as a new technology. Um, and I work with about 800 smallholder maize farmers. The fall armyworm is a pest that feeds on many, many crops, but its preferred crop at these latitudes is uh, maize. Um, the sample of the farmers that I work with um, is is uh, it's from a joint project uh, with uh, my my colleagues here, um, uh, Connor Burkardi, Jonathan DeQuit at the IAS in Stockholm, and uh, uh, Stefano Tripodi in the Copenhagen Business School. So here, just I'd like you to look at the picture for a second to you know assess sort of like what's the difference between a healthy plant and a and a, and a sick plant. So on the right, you have a farmer stepping in a healthy maize field. Uh, you see that the plants are tall, while on the left, a farmer is showing a plant that has been affected by the, by the fall armyworm. Um, the, the, um, if the pest gets your plant when the plant is very young, it can uh, affect its growing point, which means that the plant won't grow anymore and will not bear any fruit. Just to give you an idea of the extent of the, of the pest damage. And in fact, farmers know about it in my sample at baseline. Uh, I have a pest awareness of about 100%, but there are also at the same time high infection rates, so almost half of the plots are infected, um, and farmers report substantial harvest losses due to, due to the pest, which suggests that farmers don't really know what to do with this pest. The government, um, by the time um, that the sort of emergency started, had put out some guidance on its website, but um, there had not been, uh, as far as I'm aware, and uh, according to what farmers told me, there had not been sort of outreach of agricultural extension workers about the army worm um, in these areas. The practices to handle the fall army worm so this bundle of practices is mainly um, labor intensive. And it, it, it includes field scouting twice a week, planting early in the season at the same time as other farmers, crushing the eggs and caterpillars by hand, using ash, sand and soil on infected plant, also spraying pesticide, and uh, deep burying the residue of sick plants um, uh, under the, under the uh, topsoil. 
Um, I will pause here for a second um, to see if there are clarifying questions that you think yeah. that need should be addressed. Yeah, now. yeah, Benedetta, that's great. Thanks. You timed it perfectly. I think Andy has a question. Andy, do you want to? No idea. Does it seem to be? It's in the chat. Okay, so I guess my question is, I mean, it seems like some of these are negative externalities. Now, maybe on net you have a positive externality, but for example, if I spray my crop, that means the pests are more likely to end up on your crop. Yeah, um, so that's a possibility. Yeah, so even, about that? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, that's a possibility. In this case, um, it is not seem to be happening. Farmers are not concerned about that. So I've collected their beliefs about this, and they do think that um, when someone sprays the crop, um, the, the pest doesn't move to your crop. It's also because, um, I should also add, um, of, because of the biology that I won't go uh, into details, but I'm happy to discuss at a later stage, when you spray pesticide and the pest is actually caught, but the past does not have the possibility to move to another um, to another field. But it, it, it's a very it's a very important point. Thank you. So then I will proceed. Um, Please go ahead, Benedetta. Thanks. Sounds good. So let's get into the into the design. So um, as I as I mentioned in the introduction, I use a sort of an old technique in a new way. Um, I use the Becker de Groot Marshak uh, mechanism to measure willingness to pay um, for the training. So um, I use a variant, um, a multiple priceless variant um, that uh, works in the following ways. So a farmer um, states their maximum willingness to pay by responding to a set of increasing ticket or leave it offers. So I will ask, would you buy the training for zero? Would you buy the training for 2,000 shillings? And so on until 40,000 shillings. Um, uh, once the farmer has decided on what the or maximum willingness to pay is, then we will draw a random price. If the price is, um, if the willingness to pay is larger than the price or equal to the price, then the farmer has to buy. If instead, in paying price P the randomly uh, chosen price. If instead the willingness to pay is lower than the price, the farmer cannot buy. So this is how my adapted mechanism works in this situation. Let me now show you a sort of like a, a stylized village with six people. Um, I'm going to pause a little bit on this because I think it's not immediate and it's, uh, it's, it's crucial that it, this point sort of gets through hopefully. So let's say that I have a village with six sample farmers. I'll talk to farmer one and ask her, what's your willingness to pay for receive this training yourself? And I'll call this W11. I'll then ask farmer one, what's your willingness to pay for farmer two to receive this training? What is your willingness to pay for farmer three, four, five, and six to receive this training? So every farmer is stating six valuations in this case, one for self, one for the other. Side note, these farmers have names in the, in, in the experiment, and I collect a battery of questions to understand whether the farmers know each other, what's the extent of the connections between them. So then I do this with all of the six farmers in, in, uh, in my um, sample farmers in my village. So then in the end, I will have six valuations for self, 30 valuations for others. Um, only one of the choices that you saw in this grid will actually be implemented. And I'll come back to you um, in a second to show you how um, it's randomly selected. Um, but let me also um, state that farmers are primed at the beginning of this exercise. They are informed that the full army worm spreads by proximity. So then, I have told you now, this is how I measure the value of externalities. So now we're getting in, instead into how do I um, measure the source of the externalities and their importance. Um, so I um, carry out two um, belief shock interventions, let's call them. One, uh, to um, randomly, effect, randomly um, exogenously change the perceived contagion externalities. So um, when I'm speaking to farmer one, I elicit their willingness to pay for self. Then I elicit their willingness to pay for, for farmer two. 
When I get to farmer three, I ask farmer one, what do you think is the distance between your maze plot and farmer three's plot? And then I will tell them a true distance that I know because I've collected GPS um, location of the plots at baseline. So when I um, provide truthful information about the distance between the plot of one and the plot of three, then one will learn that either three is surprisingly far away, so she should be less concerned with three because the contagion externalities with three are lower, or the three is surprisingly closer. And so then she should be more concerned about the, will the, the, the contagion externalities with farmer three. Instead, uh, when it comes to um, uh, generating random variation in knowledge externalities, I uh, perform what I call a um, meeting treatment. So when I get to, for example, asking farmer one, what's her willingness to pay for four? I'll invite her to a meeting with farmer four. Now, this means that my assumption is that if they meet, the chance that they will exchange knowledge is higher than if they had not met. So knowledge externalities should increase and you should, in the meeting should make it easier to, um, to share the technology. So one final, second last final feature of my design is that this is not, a, um, this is a within farmer design and not an across farmer design. So the, the same farmer is, is exposed to a control condition that is their willingness to pay for farmer two in this case, and then two treatment conditions. The ones in which I have exogenously, exogenously shocked contagion externalities and the conditions in which I have exogenously shocked knowledge externalities. So I will be in my empirical analysis comparing within farmer across valuations. And then, you know, every farmer sees a different uh, randomization uh, of the treatments that are provided um, to, to them with respect to their willingness to pay for others. And now last point, um, I randomly select just one of this, um, uh, of this um, elicitations in, the, in this grid to be implemented. So first, I do this in two steps. First, I say to farmers, only one of you is the decision makers, which means that only the evaluations made by one of you will actually be implemented. And second, in this case, it's not, it's farmer five. And second, I tell them among the decisions of the decision maker, only one will be the one that's actually implemented. So in this case, is this choice. This means that the, if the willingness to pay of farmer five for farmer four is larger than the price, farmer five buys the training for four. The point of doing this is very important in my design because it, al it allows me to shut down um, uh, complementarities and substitutabilities in demand. Because otherwise a farmer would have thought, what happens if I train three and four or four and five? And then uh, like this phenomenon would have, would have kicked in. But what I'm interested in measuring here is what happens when we switch the adoption status of one farmer or none. And this is what my project can measure. So in practical terms, the way I do this is that I give farmers a sealed card um, at the end of the elicitation. You see that this is farmer Emugati. Uh, Emugati has willingness to pay for self of 40,000 Ugandan shillings. And Emugati has willingness to pay of 30,000 for Neapidi, 10,000 for Esther, and so on. Then farmer after the elicitation opens the sealed card. And what they find is first the price, the randomized price, you see here is 28,000, here is 16,000. The card also, card also bears the information whether a farmer is the decision maker or not. So here it says, congratulations, you've been selected to be the decision maker. And then um, the card also contains the name of the farmers for whom you're buying the training. So your sort of choice that matters if you're the decision maker. So here you see your choice that matters is your willingness to pay for training Otieno. So the farmer goes in the, then in this, in this, at the end of the elicitation is fully informed about how much they're paying and for whom they're paying. This uh, project is not just um, 
sort of uh, hypothetical. I do actually implement it because one week after the elicitation, an agronomist visits the, um, the villages uh, and takes the money from the farmers that are supposed to pay, gives the training to the farmers that are supposed to receive the training, and um, for full information and disclosure, then one training session costs about 34 Ugandan shillings. Uh, these are individual training sessions. Um, and that's about $30 in, uh, in PPP terms. So this then marks the end of my um, design um, section. So I will pause again to see if there are clarifying questions about the design. Thanks, Benedetta. Yeah, we have a couple. So maybe I'll ask people to ask them themselves. Chris, maybe you want to jump in? OK, um, yeah, this is fascinating. Um, would the meeting treatment also provide an increased opportunity for reciprocity um, that the person for whom you've paid for training might be grateful to you for doing so? And this would be a, a way for increasing the probability that you'll be rewarded in some way. So th this is definitely a possibility that like after the elicitation is done, when the randomized choice uh, has, been, has been selected and then implemented and after that, that farmer will be uh, more grateful to me. Um, I, I, I see this as something that uh, is potentially feasible. But if then your point is going to, towards wondering also whether this implies that farmers sort of organize side payments or, you know, they anticipate that someone is going to be grateful to them and so they ask to chip in. Uh, this is something that I ask at follow-up, um, and I do not find, farmers do not, um, not no farmers but two um, declare that they have been uh, co sort of co-paying or there have been side payments between them. So that's something that at this stage I don't um, worry about, at least for what the data says. So Great, thanks. Kind of farmers, I found that in a slightly different way. Yeah, I was um, going to do... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to do a couple of clarifying questions from the webinar Q&A, just because sure. those are clarifying. Uh, so can I jump over to those very quickly? And then, Benedetta, you should feel free sure. to defer. Just to give you a sense of time, you have about 25 minutes. So if you want me to stop questions, just tell me, because I want you to be able to finish the presentation. So Stacy has a question about how did you ensure farmers understood the experiment? Yeah, um, good question. So. Uh, there is a battery of um, trial rounds before this round, and there are a we I also implement some uh, comprehension checks. So before being uh, receiving, uh, sorry, having to elicit their willingness to pay for the training and for other people, I do three rounds in which farmers first tell me um, first uh, exercise in uh, um, eliciting their willingness to pay for a, an experimental voucher. Uh, then uh, I elicit their willingness to pay for a piece of soap. Uh, and then I elicit their willingness to pay for historical information about the, the army worm. And so this, I believe that this tri these three rounds give farmers a very good idea about what it means uh, to bid optimally um, and be familiar with the process. Second, I do uh, comprehension checks and um, mm from what I can see, so from um, um, when I um, uh, when I elicit farmers' uh, willingness to pay for like the experimental voucher, that voucher has a fixed value, so I know whether farmers are bidding correctly or whether they are not bidding correctly, and I find that 75% of them bid correctly in the in the voucher round, so that's, uh, that should be um, encouraging and 85% of them bids also bid uh, uh, sort of optimally also uh, when it comes to the, the soap round. And for a further definition of this of this optimal check, I refer you to the, um, the, the, the newly published paper on the JDE uh, with um, John DeQuid, Con Conor Burcardi, and uh, Stefano Tripodi and Selim Gulesh that we just um, put out on willingness to bail station in the field. Second thing also in, very important kind of disclaimer as well, this sample is an experienced sample. This is, these are people that um, about an year before my experiment have had their willingness to pay for fertilizer elicited. So that's something that researchers that want to replicate this may wanna pay attention to. Great, thanks Benedetta. Andrew, do you wanna jump in with your question? 
Yeah. So, so one of the I think questions arise in the literature is often missed is is the extent to which there are externalities, but second, are those externalized are those externalities internalized, say through social graces, right? If you you know, you brought some benefit to the village, you're treated better. It's not necessarily transfer payments. And I'm trying to decide whether your approach actually allows one to do that. And I think the answer is no, because in fact, you know, uh, the, the key question is really whether my willingness to pay is different from the social product of the training. And there isn't any way to find out what the social product of the training is, even from your various solicitations. Does that make sense? So perhaps we can have this discussion later as well. But I, it strikes me it doesn't answer the question that I'm most interested in on this issue of whether externalities are internalized. So um, I, uh, it may be that the audio of my computer is not um, optimal, and so I may have misunderstood, but if I understood correctly. Um, so uh, when it comes to um, sort of the measurement of then how these externalities, like the measurement that we have sort of like also translate into social benefit, or like a measurement of the total externalities, I will um, uh, in the results section show how valuations can sort of be interpreted um, as a uh, as a measure of the uh, of the average benefits in a village. Um, but if I am I if I answered your question or have I not gotten your point? Well, let's see when you get there. <laughs> Andrew, by the way, I think it's your audio because I can't hear you that well either. So. Uh, oh, okay. I don't think oh, it's the audio. Here. I was struggling to hear Andrew as well. Great. Do you want to carry on, Benedetta? I will. Okay. Awesome. So, Thank um, you. Quickly on the results. Um, they are organized in such a way that I'm going to show you. Let's take two results on the value of externalities and two results on the sources of externalities. So starting from uh, the value of externalities, the valuations allow us to draw a demand curve for the training. So also, I'm just showing here the demand curve of like the training for themselves to um, provide evidence that you know this product that um, we went to the village with and we sold it's something the farmers wanted. Um, it has a it has value to the farmers. It's farmers' uh, me median willingness to pay is 20,000 Ugandan shillings. That's about 17 uh, PPP dollars. Um, and then more interestingly, I would, I would think this is um, the demand curve of the training for of providing the training for others. So the mean willingness to pay for others in my sample is about 10,000 shillings. Uh, the, the median, I'm sorry, um, is that about 10,000 shillings or nine, uh, nine US dollars. So um, then the, the, the ratio, the median ratio between them uh, is, is, is 50%, which shows that you know, farmers are willing to pay for themselves um, about four, four um, days wage of agricultural day labor, that's the equivalent of 20,000, and for others, two days uh, of uh, daily uh, of, uh, wage, um, wage labor. Um, and here, I think it's interesting to show you sort of like the joint distribution of willingness to pay for self and for others. So um, the, here you can see on the y-axis, willingness to pay for self. On the x-axis, the willingness to pay for others. Most of the people uh, pr uh, have higher willingness to pay for self than, than for others, as we would have all correctly guessed, I would think the lower quadrant is uh, uh, is almost empty and you know the most the most frequent is what i mentioned earlier uh, willing to pay 10000 shillings for others and 20000 shillings for self the bubble size um, is proportional to the the frequency of the of this observation um so moving on to sort of instead the second result on the value of externalities and this is uh, hopefully speaking to andrew's point um, so we, we can use valuations to calculate the average social benefit among sampled farmers uh, in, in, uh, in each village. So we can say, we can calculate the average, um, the average social benefit if everyone is trained as the average willingness to pay for self. So that is sort of about 20,000. 
um, we can calculate the average uh, social benefit if the best farmer is trained. Let's define the best farmer as the most popular one, the one that everyone sort of wants to pay to pay for, wants to pay the most for. Um, and the 15,000 is the, uh, the average uh, benefit that then I calculate for the best farm, the best trained, if the best is trained. And then um, similarly, let's define the worst uh, farmer as the farmer that people are willing to pay the least for. And we see that um, averaging the willingness to pay for the worst in, in, in each village, we have 10,000. Now the trick with this, these are uh, gross values. Um, they don't take into account the cost of the training. And we know that um, delivering this type of a program, um, an individualized rural training is expensive. So if I subtract from these gross values, the training cost, then I have that um, the, the net, uh, it, the, the net um, value, social value if everyone is trained becomes negative. So it, it is overall much better to train at least one farmer that we know. And then we can also see by, the, by looking at the difference between the value generated if the best is trained or the worst is trained, um, we can see that how uh, visual um, uh, evidence that getting matters, that after cost, training the best yields twice um, the, uh, the, the benefit as training the, the worst. I will now move on uh, to the second set of my results, and hopefully we have um, we have some time left. So, ten minutes sounds great. Okay. So, um, do we evaluate um, the impact of randomly shocking contagion externalities on the willingness to pay for others? I regress the willingness to pay for others. So I call this WIJ on um, the following variables. So I use the distance error that is the difference between the true distance in minutes between plots and the perceived distance. Then I define potential bad news if a farmer overestimated the true distance. You're going to have bad news because you've overestimated. So the other farmer is closer to you than what you thought. So you should worry more for this farmer. And similarly, potential good news. Um, it's equal to the distance error if the farmer underestimated the true distance. So it's good news because um, the actual distance is larger than what you thought. So you should worry less about this farmer and um, their infection status. And then bad news and good news, which are the, the betas of interest, are just potential bad news uh, multiplied by a, a, um, a treatment indicator, potential good news multiplied by a treatment indicator. So this beta one and beta two are the betas of interest. And what I find here um, is that, um, so for every extra minute of good news, um, a farmer decreases their willingness to pay us 67 shillings. This at the average, uh, at the average value of good news, this means this is equivalent to about 10% of the daily wage. I do not instead find um, an impact on telling farmers bad news that someone is closer to them than what they thought. So the sign of the coefficient is in line with what we expect. We expect being given bad news to increase the willingness to pay for others, but the, the uh, variable is really, uh, is really noisy. Um, I don't have the time to go through why the, the most likely mechanism why this may be the case. I look at that in the in the paper. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to show you um, is that I um, evaluate the impact of randomly shocking knowledge externalities on willingness to pay for others uh, by regressing willingness to pay for others on an indicator for whether I propose the meeting or not. So in this case, I don't really find any impact. So if I propose that farmers are going to meet um, and then see whether someone is willing to pay more for that farmer or not, I don't really see anything. Of course, um, this doesn't mean that knowledge externalities are not important. We know 
uh, we know that they are, but um, my experiment, in this case, my treatment may not have gotten at that. One thing that I can do with that though, to uh, uh, still um, investigate knowledge externalities is that I can um, look at the variables that uh, correlate the most with, um, uh, and, and look at the uh, physical distance and uh, mainly social distance variable that correlate the most with willingness to pay for others. So what I do is that I let um, three model selection algorithms identify the correlates of willingness to pay for others. I run a best subset, a forward stepwise, and a lasso. And my, um, I feed the algorithm the following two types of, of variables. So variables measuring the physical distance between uh, farmer's plots, so true and perceived plot distance and home distance between farmers. And then uh, a battery of questions on a battery of variables measuring social distance. So these, these are 13 measures that I take um, almost verbatim from um, the Banerjee and Cawthor's paper on um, the diffusion of microfinance. And what I find here is that there are three variables that the three models systematically pick up. So one is um, true plot, plot distance, and the other two are whether farmers know each other. So if they know each other, they're more likely to be wanting to pay um, uh, for each other. And then one thing that for, you know, I think is a, it's not a smoking gun, but it's very interesting to, to note, and I believe it's suggestive evidence of, of knowledge externalities, is that whether the farmer receives advice from that other farmer is a big uh, predictor of wanting to pay uh, for that farmer. So um, on this note, I will just conclude, wrap up, and close it close down by saying, you know, I I um, um, used in this paper a new way to price externalities, um, and that uh, is the willingness to pay for others. Um, I apply this concept to um, the willingness to pay um, for others to receive pest control technologies, and I find that um, it's equal to two days wage. And then I use my evaluations to calculate the social benefits, finding that it's highly heterogeneous, um, and then which leads me to investigating the sources of, of the externalities to formulate the optimal policy. And so here, what we then see is that with knowledge externalities, if they are the ones that matter the most, then the social centrality matters. So we will want to train and target farmers that are central in the social network. With contagion externalities, we will want and train farmers that have plots that are centrally located in the, in the village. Um, and one thing that I definitely learned from this is that the subsidies for this technology would not be ideal unless we can target them, um, given the high heterogeneity in the externalities that I observe. So that's all for me. Thank you for uh, listening in and looking forward to your questions and feedback. Great, thanks, Benedetta. Um, they, we, have a, we have several minutes for questions, actually. So if folks have questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A or use the chat if you're a panelist, because uh, the panelists can't use the Q&A and I'm happy to call on you. You can also use hands if you're a panelist and I'm gonna try and call on you. So if there are questions, happy to. Happy to take them. Yeah, Robin, did I see your hand go up? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering about, you know, the, an alternative approach to controlling a pest like this. Would it, would, would it not be more sensible going back to what Andrew said that some bigger entity than an individual farmer would get rid of the pest in a larger area so you got rid of the contagion? Is, does the government do any of that? Does it try to kind of offer that service so that many farms are cleared and you, or are there examples where this pest has been eradicated? Because it seems like this would just keep coming back. So I'm not sure whether the, this way of intervening is, is optimal because you presumably have just outbreaks each year. Is it 
go through the maize population again. So I guess two things, has it been controlled by some bigger party in another place or is the government here trying to do any of that? Yeah, um, so uh, the answer is um, yes. Um, the government that I know has been taking a coordinated action on this in Africa has been the South African government. Um, it has been, for example, sending out um, uh, planes that uh, spray pesticide. I'm afraid that I don't know the technical name for those planes in English. Um, and yeah, so it would be, uh, of course, adding um, an institution that is able to you know, capitalize on the fact that this is going to generate a large social benefit and, and, and take um, that kind of action is um, would be would be the best. In this case, uh, I think um, it's important to you know my my work. I see this work my work as sort of like laying the ground and saying we can measure this using um, uh, using people's valuations, and this can be informative for the government to decide uh, to decide what to do, to decide whether to do it, to decide how to do it and how much resources they want to devote to this given um, the social benefits that people think that they will get from it. All right, thank you. Thanks. Are there other questions? Uh, Francis, do you want to ask your question? Absolutely. Yeah, so um, representation. I, I was just curious with a um, you know the, the the farmers meet in treatment. I was just wondering if if they meet, does does their interaction actually reveal anything about the distance between their plots? And um, if so, um, then should we think of this as maybe the knowledge externality here subsuming that of the contagion? Like, uh, do you have any interaction? Like, just some thoughts on that. So. Um... I, um, I'm definitely sympathetic with the point that like revealing the true distance, uh, you know, may be in, informative of other things. I, I, I think that like in order to, uh, to um, fully convey why I believe that this treatment was important, if I'm getting your point right, is that um, because location choices are not random, um, we need to generate variation in distance between people because we know that if we just look at the distance between people, people that like each other more, so that would have potentially higher knowledge externalities between them may also be more likely to have contagion externalities between each other because they locate um, each other, uh, they locate close to each other. Can, 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 would you mind repeating your second point then? When the farmers meet, um... Does, do you think their interactions at all might reveal anything about even the distance between their plots, which is effectively what you are doing in, this, in the first treatment, right? So I'm curious to see whether that revelation might say something about how one of the externalities is subsuming the other. Yeah, so the answer to that is certainly not given the timing of the experiment, because when I, um, I shock, their knowledge about mutual distance at, at, at during the elicitation exercise. Uh, or, you know, I propose them to meet. I just propose them to meet um, during the elicitation exercise. And then after a week, there is the implementation. So in the implementation, they will meet if they're supposed to meet. If they're supposed to receive, uh, one of them is supposed to receive the train, they will receive the train. So because of the different timing of the two things, um, the elicitation is completely unaffected by anything that could later be learned uh, during the meeting, if the meeting happens. Uh, right. Another note of the meeting is that uh, like farmers, um, like the meeting is framed to be a, a meeting in which they can exchange knowledge about the, the fall army worm. And when it actually happens, it's sort of uh, moderated by one of the enumerators that encourages them to speak about it. Thanks, Bernadette. I'm going to try and jump in with one, uh, if we can catch the last two questions before we run out of time. Robert, you have a question. Uh, not sure he's around. Okay, let's jump to Chris and I'll come back to Robert in case he comes back online. Okay, quick question. Can you do it again? Um, the, 
part of the knowledge spillover, of course, is knowing how valuable this is um, and learning about its value. Um, it'd be interesting to see how people's willingness to pay changes after training and after using. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. Uh, that would be really cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was an easy answer, Benedetta. <laughs> yeah, would <love> to. <laughs> okay, I'm going to quickly check if Robert came on. We have one minute left. So if Robert is back, I think he might have dropped off. I think he's dropped off. So given I don't see other questions in the Q&A or hands up or anything in the chat, Robin, do you want to call it a break for this session? And I think we come back. In 10 minutes if i'm not wrong i think that probably makes sense to come back on the hour the 10, that's that's in 10 minutes is that what the schedule is sorry i should have checked I'm not sure yes there is a break there's a 10 minute break come back on the hour i thought i was right uh and we'll see you all then and thanks benedetta for a great presentation uh and keeping to time so well thank you bye bye everyone <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so are we ready to go? Excellent. So welcome back. Um, and for our next session, we have uh, the Gollins giving us a talk on human mobility and spatial frictions in three African countries. So, Doc, um, well, you have 50 minutes in total, but um, if you aim for 45 minutes, then if there are any last minute burning questions, we can take it in the last five. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Robert, and thanks to the organizers for including this paper in, in the session. I also have to say greetings from stormy New England, where um, the wind and rain are such that there's a distinct possibility I might lose power or internet during the course of this presentation. If so, my co-author Martina Kirchberger, um, one of two co-authors along with Paul Blanchard, both from Trinity Dublin, Martina's on standby to take over. The probability that that happens will increase if you ask me any really hard questions, just to be clear. Um, the, the background for this paper is that we're thinking about a literature that's documented large gaps in nominal wages and productivity and living standards across sectors and across locations within developing countries. And this focus on the role of spatial frictions that might affect the allocation of people across locations has, is something that's been well explored in the literature. Um, when we think about spatial frictions, you could think of a set of different kinds of costs fixed costs that might be the costs of, you know, the dislocation of migration or the costs of moving away from your social networks, as opposed to variable costs, which might be things like the cost of bus tickets or the cost of moving around. What we're going to do in this paper is try to make headway in understanding the kinds of, the kinds of frictions and the kind of costs that might be salient. I'm going to be very clear, this is a significantly descriptive paper. So there's not gonna be a hypothesis tested here. We're gonna explore a bunch of new data, granular data on spatial mobility of individuals. And we're gonna to try to use this to shed some light on the relevance of different types of costs, different categories of costs that we think might allow us to make headway in understanding why these gaps might persist if they persist. And of course that in itself is something that's subject to, to dispute. Um, the, the data that, that we and others have used for studying flows of people across space 
typically fall into two types of survey data. We have census or other kinds of household survey data, which are pretty good at capturing longer term migration flows. We ask people in one wave whether they're in the same location that they were in a previous wave or perhaps questions about whether they've migrated at different points in their lives. And so that might capture long-term shifts in location. And then we have a few surveys, though not very much from developing countries, to be honest, that are designed to measure commuting or, or daily travel. So there's a couple of surveys that do this. In more recent times, we have access to a variety of data. So for instance, CDR data from, from uh, mobile phone towers or smartphone app location data, which is what we'll use here, that allow us to understand something about how people are moving around the world. And so that's in this, in this presentation, I'm gonna draw on some work that we've done using very fine grain anonymized data on smartphone locations. So smartphone app locations. And I'll say more about that in just a minute. We observe uh, in total more than a million devices over an entire year in three different countries in Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and Tanzania. A lot of the literature that has previously looked at mobility, I think because of data availability issues, has focused on either commuting or migration. In other words, either very short-term or very long-term movements of people. In this paper, we're gonna focus on a third type of movement in some detail. We're gonna look at what you might characterize as visits people going from their home, loca home locations to non-home locations. And if you think about the kind of travel that people do that many of us do within the course of a year, we're gonna be able to ask questions about how often, how frequently people go different places, how frequently they leave home, how far they go, um, how long they stay there. Um, and what we're gonna find is that in our sample, we're gonna see that this type of mobility is both common, it's, it's frequent, um, the distances people travel are non-trivial, and we have samples that are big enough that we feel we can say something about the movements of um, significant numbers of people. I'm going to be very clear. So before you start asking questions about selection, I'm going to spend quite a lot of time acknowledging and describing what we know about our sample of smartphone users. They are obviously and transparently a non an atypical set of people within these three countries, though perhaps less atypical than would have been the case a decade ago. Smartphones in urban areas in all three countries are relatively commonly found. Um, and so I'm not going to make the case that this is describing what happens to the typical person in Nigeria or Tanzania or Kenya, but that there's still information that we can glean from this kind of data that tells us something about what kinds of spatial frictions might be salient and which ones might be less salient um, for thinking about human mobility and then about the persistence of gaps. Um, we'll also be able to say something a little bit more quantitative. So if you thought just in, in a broad theoretical structure about an individual who's living in um, location O for origin, who's thinking about going to a destination D for a visit, that visit you could think of as generating some kind of return, RD. And so you could think of the utility that somebody gets as relating to the, to both the return that they get and the distance that they have to travel, think of it as a driving time distance, or as some kind of a, pre uh, multiplied by some kind of an idiosyncratic preference draw. And so we'll do a little bit of work that I may get to towards the end of the talk if there's time that nests this analysis in a kind of standard gravity framework. And we'll try to relate what we have in our data to the gravity estimates that come out of other literature um, using other types of data. Uh, the kinds of gravity equations that you can get from this model are, are simple gravity estimates where you can look at the observations that people make in their choices of where to go in relation to distance, but then also in relation to origin and destination fixed effects. To estimate this kind of an equation, you need lots of observations of travel choices. And from our million devices, we have almost 5 million user days away from home. So we're going to be able to compute a gravity estimate for a very large set of people with pretty high precision 
at national scale. So again, I'll try to get to that at the end. I think that the contributions that we see ourselves making in this work really fall into three categories. The first, we, we actually spent a lot of time, and you'll see some of this, thinking about metrics, descriptive metrics, for characterizing the kind of mobility across space that we're seeing in these data, characterizing the frequency, the spatial extent. Um, we're going to think about a lot of stuff in terms of not just urban and rural, because as you'll all know, those classifications in these countries are kind of arbitrary. So we're going to do a lot in terms of population densities. We'll talk about sparsely populated areas and locally and, and densely populated localities in relation to the population density distribution across the entire country. We're going to use these measures then to provide a description of mobility within the African context. We can ask questions about whether we see much long distance travel whether we see people from sparsely populated, presumably rural areas traveling to cities or traveling to nearby towns, um, what patterns of mobility we observe across and between cities. And, and then this question about connectivity between rural and urban areas is one that obviously relates to the kind of spatial frictions. You might imagine one explanation of why we would see large and persistent gaps in wages or living standards between locations is that people in rural areas, for instance, might simply not, not know what opportunities are there in urban areas. Um, that's a very different explanation. An information friction would be a very different story than one that's located, that's based on the cost of travel or the cost of a bus ticket. And so then the third thing we'll do, again, is to estimate some gravity models that look at the, a, a certain type of variable cost of distance here. Obviously, lots of literature focusing on within country frictions in the movements of goods. So that's become an increasing area, spatial frictions in movement of goods is an increasing area of research and lots of research as well on within country frictions and movements of people, a bit less in many ways on flows of information within countries. Much of what we know about this comes from thinking about the introduction of mobile phones um, and other kinds of technologies that change the cost of acquiring information. Um, there's also literature here that I won't go into, obviously, on drawing on quantitative urban models. And there's a growing literature using the kind of data that we're using here, though primarily in uh, richer countries. A bunch of work done on COVID that drew on similar data as well. So again, we're gonna use these kind of data to think about high frequency mobility at a national scale in, in three countries in Africa. Just to give you a sense of some of the things we're gonna find here, the first is very substantial mobility flows, large fractions of days spent away from home for this sample of users, um, long distances traveled, people visiting multiple cities. We'll see that perhaps unsurprisingly, the largest cities in each country are real magnets for mobility. Um, I, I think of this as kind of the New York effect, that New Yorkers are not keen on going to other cities. Um, people don't go much from New York to Cleveland, but people from secondary cities travel to the primary cities. And we'll see that in these data. The secondary cities do appear to substitute for each other to a significant extent. People don't travel from one secondary city to another secondary city that's comparable in size. They tend to go to bigger cities. Uh, we'll see costs of distance that look fairly similar to estimates that are out there in the literature within reasonable ranges. So we think there's we're capturing something important. But again, I think what we'll see is that this type of, there's quite a lot of visiting. People travel frequently. They go places that are um, they go places repeatedly within the same within the same year when we observe them. So this is not migration flows and it's not commuting flows, it's something different. Let me tell you a little bit about our data and about the sample selection, which is, as I say, not representative of populations. And, and so obviously we're aware of that. Our sample is, our, our data consists of pings. So when your smartphone accesses the internet via an app, it sends a location ping unless you have been clever and have turned off the permission to do so, 
your phone provides location data to the app um, to the app providers on where you are at the point where you access the app. So we have data on the locations where people are when they access any one of a set of apps. We don't know exactly which apps they are, but you could think of these as being, say, WhatsApp or Facebook, or in some cases, it looks as though we may have data from Google Maps or navigation software. We don't know which apps they are, it's not the universe of all apps. It's a set of specific apps. And when people access these, we know where they are. We know the device identifier. So we don't actually know people, but we know the phone itself. So we identify individual devices rather than people. And we have a timestamp and a longitude latitude location. We begin by assigning devices. And I'm going to use device and people interchangeably recognizing that that's imprecise. Though for smartphones, people share devices probably a bit less than they do with other kinds of devices. Um, we're going to assign a user or a device to a home location, which is the modal 0 0.01 degree cell that the user is seen in between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. That's a pretty standard practice. Um, and then we can also think of what happens when we add two additional restrictions that we're going to use to try to work our way towards a, um, a high confidence sample. So places, we're going to look at places um, and users who observed in a home location for more than 10 nights. And when the user is at that home location for at least 50% of the nights that we observe them all together. So our high confidence sample is going to satisfy both of those restrictions. Um, Paper has lots of stuff about how we deal with um, messy data. Al although it sounds as though the data are hugely precise, there are some weird anomalies in the data and we try to deal with those as best we can. We also spend some time in the paper talking about how we might isolate um, what you could call transit pings, somebody who's in a car or a vehicle that's moving with their phone on. So we, we do our best to purge that turns out to be a relatively small phenomenon in our data, but we're able to purge the data of those pretty effectively. To give you a sense of what the full sample looks like and what our high confidence sample looks like, our full sample um, consists of about a million users, uh, more in Nigeria than either Kenya or Tanzania. The pings ratio is the number of pings per user that we have. Our high confidence sample is obviously a much shrunken version of, we end up with about 10% of the total users. Um, and these are users who also we observe pinging much more frequently. So we're trimming not only people that we um, observe relatively infrequently, but don't have high confidence in where they live, but we're left with a sample of users that we see quite a lot. Um, so, um, yes. If I could, uh, there are a couple of questions here that, uh, Maybe we could quickly take um, as you go along. Um, one is whether, um, from Anna, saying uh, whether people are traveling home to their region of origin from, it says how many people are traveling home to their region of origin from a capital city? And does it matter for the gravity equation if those who move far from their region of origin um, have a low perceived cost of travel? Right. So we, um, two answers to this, and I think I'll answer the second questions in the Q&A at the same time. We don't know anything about the device owners other than, other than location. So we don't know gender. We don't know what they, there are things we can infer we, or that we could potentially infer if we were really willing to, um, you know, to probe deeply into the patterns of use. So could we, could we, rather cleverly infer the gender of individual users by looking at where they go and what kinds of what kinds of places we observe them? The answer is probably yes. We've thus far shied away from doing anything like that out of privacy concerns, which we think need to be taken seriously. But that also, to some extent, keeps us um, when we if if we see people going between. Um, as Anna asks, between a region of origin and a capital city, we, we have a home location. We can say something about other locations that people visit frequently, um, but we don't 
we've been so far reluctant to try to pin down exactly the purpose of different visits. I'll say something, I'll be able to categorize the kinds of visits that people make, but we're, we're not trying thus far to make much inference about where they're going. Um, so let me come back to that a bit further on. I'll, I'll show you a bit more of the data, I think, in, in a second. That may answer some of the questions. Um, so let me give you just a couple more descriptives to give you, again, a sense of what's in the data. So here we have for each of the three countries, um, one variable is the length of observation. So we, we observe a year of data, but we don't observe all of the devices for 365 days. Some people have new devices, and so we pick them up at the point where they enter the sample. And so we have the, the length of observation is the time between the first day and the 365 that we see them and the last day that we observe them. The number of days seen for our high confidence sample, the mean is about 39 for Kenya, about 40 for Nigeria, it's about 40 for all of our users. So these aren't necessarily people that we observe using their device or connecting these apps every day. Um, and then pings per day works out to about 100 for the, for the days that we observe them. Obviously, there's a few users here. The max is, um, is extraordinarily high. We see some people who are connected all the time. Um, let me talk a bit about selection because it's an obvious concern here. Not a concern, it's, a, it's just a feature of these data is that they're coming from smartphone users, smartphone app users, who we wouldn't want to claim are representative of the entire national populations in these countries. So I can tell you a bit about these about smartphone users, I can do three things that I'll tell you about rather briefly. The first is we can match the home locations to a particular population density bin. And so that tells us where these people are from to some extent, whether they're urban or rural, and if rural, how rural. So I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. The second thing is we have secondary data on um, from nationally representative surveys for each of these three countries that looks at the characteristics of users and so of, of different kinds of devices. So I can tell you from nationally representative surveys what smartphone users look like and how they differ from other people in, in the data. Um, and then we can say something about the home locations of our users. We're able to match a surprisingly large fraction of our users live in locations that are not very far from DHS clusters. So we can map their locations to a set of adjacent DHS clusters. And we can then compare those DHS clusters that are near where our people live to the broader nationally representative DHS data to say something about whether the locations where our users live are different or similar to other urban or rural locations. So we can compare our rural locations to all of the DHS rural locations and our urban locations to the broader set of DHS urban locations. That doesn't tell you whether our users are unusual, but it tells you whether they live in, in weird places. And I'll make the argument that our users live in broadly typical places conditional on being urban or rural. So let me come back to that in a second. So first, let me just show you a picture on home locations. And this is for Nigeria, but we have the same data for the other countries. The left-hand panel here shows a map of our users' home locations. Um, it's a heat map. Um, what you see is that the users we have are scattered broadly across the country. They're not all in Lagos or Abuja. Um, they're showing up, you could pretty well populate, you pretty well identify the cities in Nigeria here. But what you see is we also have a little bit of a freckling of users across the entire country map. And on the right hand panel, we have the population density um, from WorldPop. And what you see is that we're picking up um, not just the big cities, but it looks as though we're picking up towns, it looks as though we're picking up rural locations to some degree here as well. So the coverage of our users in this case is broadly national. So in 112 of the 115 regional capitals, 
there's a strong correlation between population and users. Um, so, and, and the, you know, what you'll see in general is that our users are going to be concentrated in more densely populated areas. It's a, a strongly urban biased sample, but we're also picking up people in relatively sparsely populated areas. What's interesting is that even within urban con conglomerations, we're seeing that we're able to pick up people in different parts of cities. So here, for instance, this is zooming in on Lagos. And what you'll see is that we're able to pick up um, where users live that maps pretty well again to the census data, to, to the gridded population data from WorldPop. Um, our users are covering broadly the, the same places within an urban area, an urban periphery that we would expect to see people. So again, we're picking up a set of people broadly where the population lives. Having said that, our population, our sample is concentrated in the highest density locations within countries. So here, and a bunch of the following graphs, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you things relative to population density bins. So what I mean by that is if you took the population of Kenya and you lined up the people in Kenya from the people who live in the most densely populated areas to the most sparsely populated areas, and you divided them into, into 10 deciles, and then you said, let's characterize the locations where those people live. So we're, we're not talking about deciles of locations, but deciles of people. So you take the 10% the of the people who live in the most sparsely populated areas, obviously live in a much more than 10% of the locations. They live in a very broad range of areas. So what I'm showing you here is that we have relatively few users who live in the most sparsely populated areas as we get from that population density bin. Our users are concentrated in the three or four most densely populated bins, um, but we have users across all 10 decile bins. 70% or so in all three countries are falling into the highest density bins. So again, somewhat unsurprisingly, this is a sample that's skewed towards urban populations or densely populated urban populations. Um, let me give you just a couple more characteristics of the sample and then Robert, I'll stop and see if there's a couple of questions I should pick up at that point. Sure. Here's just the secondary data that we have. It shows us that in, the, in all three countries, urban populations, so this is for rural and urban populations in a nationally representative sample from each of the three countries, we ask what kind of mobile phones people have. And um, so for the, the color gradient here from pale blue to dark blue is from no mobile phone to a basic, um, a basic mobile phone to a, a feature phone. Um, and then the right hand dark blue column here is a smartphone. So what you see is that Smartphone users or smart and feature phone users are about 60% of urban populations in both Kenya and Nigeria, lower than that in Tanzania. Many fewer rural people with smartphones in these data. That's consistent with what we're seeing in our sample. Um, if you have a smartphone, conditional on having a smartphone, you do use apps. That's true kind of across the, across the three countries. Smartphone users do use apps. So we're less worried about selection on the margin of people who have smartphones and whether or not we might pick them up when they ping the internet with, with these apps. We do know from these secondary data, this is just looking at income distribution across people who have different types of phone devices. And these data, by the way, come from the same calendar year approximately as our, as our data. And as you'd expect, smartphone users and feature phone users are somewhat wealthier on average than, um, than those with, with basic mobile phones. But actually the big difference is between all three of those groups and people with no mobile phone. All right, let me, let me then very briefly say something about these DHS matching. We're, we're able to match our urban users to DHS, to nearby DHS clusters. And unsurprisingly, the 
the match here tells us that our sample of urban users are in locations that are fairly typical of urban areas. The more interesting and unsurprising result is that our rural users are in locations where, so their nearby DHS clusters are atypical relative to the overall DHS rural sample. The probably because they're somewhat more um, proximate to urban areas would be our guess or proximate to roads. So our users live in areas that are um, where education levels are somewhat higher, access to pipe water and constructed floors, these things are somewhat more prevalent. So they're in somewhat um, preferred rural locations on average. So again, if you want to think about how our sample is skewed, that'll give you a sense. The urban sample is probably fairly typical of urban users. The rural sample is undoubtedly a bit skewed towards less, um, even where people are in relatively sparsely populated areas, maybe skewed towards um, better favored, better favored locations. And let me pause there and take questions about selection overall while I just put this slide up. Okay, so if there are any clarifying questions. Do you want me to pick these up myself, Robert? Or... Um, Anna has um, Anything I should uh, answer more here? of a comment. Um, but Francis Anand has a question. Francis, do you want to ask the question quickly? Yeah, so uh, Doug, I was just wondering if, if you could say something about really the natural restriction on the sample, given that uh, if there's no cell phone coverage, then essentially, you know, you are, you know, constrained in terms of even just making it to the sample, right? So I was wondering if you could say something about that and, and how, you know, this will matter more generally. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think, again, the main thing to say here is that we have, we're, we're making no argument that this is a sample that's representative of all, that's population representative um, at the national level. The argument I want to make that maybe is that we're seeing users in a broad range of locations. We're seeing, I, I want to suggest that we can infer something about the movement patterns of our users that might be informative of patterns of mobility across the broader population. Not that our users are typical, but that we're if we discount appropriately, and I don't know how to do that in a quantitative sense, but for sure we're not capturing the people who live in areas without cell coverage and don't use phones. Although to be clear, we might capture some people who live in locations without cell coverage, but who have phones so that when they travel, they're able to connect. There's undoubtedly some of that as well. Um, so I'd say it's more, the, the sample is what it is. I think it's informative. I want to use it in certain ways that I think are consistent with what the data quality lets us do. But you'll be the judge of that, I guess. Um, let me plug away here and show you a little bit about the mobility patterns, because that's, I think, the interesting stuff here. Well, and, um, and uh, yes, sorry, go ahead, Robert. No, so I was just going to ask whether you could speak uh, Tony's question as well. Um, and he says it's any chance that smartphone is handed over from one user to another, perhaps within the same family, and then initial owner acquiring different, perhaps later version of the cell phone device? Yeah, there's, there's undoubtedly some of this. Um, we all know from personal experience how this works. So we can't be sure ever that a device is used by a single user over the course of the year that we observe it. So we have to be a little bit careful in what we're saying. I am gonna talk about devices and users interchangeably, but there's obviously a big footnote that goes next to that, that those are not necessarily the same. It's also of course possible that the same individual carries multiple smartphones. Yeah. I think that was much more common a few years back when many people carried phones that connected to different networks. I think there's a bit less of that, but of course we may be seeing some of that too. Um, we are able to, to some extent to check for that in the data and to see whether we have multiple devices residing at precisely the same home location. Um, to the extent that we have that, it's gonna be tiny, um, but, but it is possible that that's there in the data. So let me show you a few measures of mobility. 
I'll show you something about frequency, about distance, about densities visited, about matrices of who goes where that I think is, is going to be useful and informative. First, let me just look at data that we observe the fraction of days on which we observe users more than 10 kilometers from their home location. And what you see is that a significant number of the days when we observe people, they're more than 10 kilometers away from home. I figure 10 to 15% of the days in which we observe people are days when they're more than 10 kilometers away from home at some point in the day. That's true across the three countries. There may be, by the way, a second type of selection. It may be that we're more likely to observe people when they're traveling than when they're home. That may be precisely when you, when you get your smartphone out and connect to WhatsApp to call home or, or something else. Um, but So there may be some selection built in here. But again, striking that we see um, quite a lot of users um, and, and quite a lot of days with mobility beyond 10 kilometers. Um, how far do people go? Well, we see um, the average distance for non-home ping, so a, a ping that's not from the home location, uh, is sort of 30 to 50 kilometers for an average ping. So people are going reasonably far. We're seeing quite a lot of quite a lot of observations where people are, um, you know, far far away from home. It's not just that we observe people when they go down the road to the next town or when they go across the city. We're observing people who are quite frequently going um, significant distances. And I'll have more to say about that in a second. One thing that people often want to know is how much of what we're observing is commuting. We can answer that question by defining a work location analogous to the way we define a home location the work location is the modal small cell where we observe a user between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. And with similar restrictions to get a high confidence sample of that these are places where we frequently see people during the workday. Um, and the interesting, though perhaps unsurprising thing for these three countries is that for most of our users, the home location and the work location as defined in this way are identical. That the place where we see them in the middle of the day in weekdays is for most of our users the same place where we see them at night within um, within a narrow of a couple of hundred meters, I believe, is what we define as the distance. Um, so overwhelmingly, this is not commuting data. These are not things that are being driven by seeing people moving back and forth between home and work. Work is at home, or home is at work, and that also. I think suggests some things about who's in our sample, that it's not all, um, it's not all expats going to, going to jobs from the suburbs. It's not all government officials um, traveling back and forth. These are a lot of people who live where they work and work where they live. One way to think about the mobility flows is again, to break this down by the density bins. So the 10% of our, the, the users we have who are living in the most sparsely populated areas here are in the what we characterize as the first decile in the density bin, going up to the most densely populated areas on the right here. And if you ask of people we observe whose home location is in a very sparsely populated area, and again, this isn't a big number of people in the sample, how frequently, um, how frequently do you observe these people visiting locations in other density deciles? And the answer is we observe people from very sparsely populated areas. We observe 43% of them in the most densely populated locations in, in our sample. And similarly, we observe um, you know, three quarters of them in very, very densely populated areas. So people from sparsely populated areas are popping up and we're seeing them visiting cities. Um, we're also seeing them visiting other places in sparsely populated areas outside their home location. So this, the diagonals here are non-home locations in the same density decile. So we see people moving around within similarly um, densely populated areas. 
but we see mobility across across in all directions, including interestingly, and maybe related to the question Anna asked earlier, we see people whose home locations are in densely populated, presumably urban areas, traveling to sparsely populated areas. Perhaps this is back to back to family home locations. Um, we don't know for sure. Um, on the work locations, I think I, sorry, I already said this, I'm moving backwards. Fraction of days where we observe people, um, again, if we look at the people who are most likely to be observed far away from home, it's the people in the most sparsely populated areas. People who live in the most densely populated areas don't tend to travel as far on average. Again, I think of this as the New York effect, getting a New Yorker to come to to New Haven, Connecticut, um, 75 miles away is very difficult. They have everything they want in the city. London people think it's much farther to go to Oxford than Oxford people think it is to go to London. Um, and I think that's a fairly common phenomenon. And um, in the same vein, we can, we can um, look at the average distance from the home location of non-home pings, and we see that those distances are farther for the people who live in sparsely populated areas. So they tend to travel um, 90 to 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers in Nigeria for the average non-home ping. And people in the most densely populated areas, we observe their non-home pings are not as far away. We can ask how often we observe people visiting one or more cities other than the city that they live in. So here again, in population density terms, we'd expect that the people in population density bins, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten, might be urban or peri-urban people. And the people in the least, pop least densely populated bins are very likely non-urban people. We observe that the yellow here are people who we don't observe in any city other than the one that is their home, lo their home location. And people in in cities are most likely not to be observed elsewhere. But across all the density bins, we see a substantial fraction of individuals making visits to one or more non-home cities. So people are traveling to cities other than the ones they live in. The shading here is telling you that for people in sparsely populated areas, they pop up in um, maybe 20% of them pop up in two, three, or more cities. And um, that's for Kenya a little bit higher than that in Nigeria, a little bit lower than that in Tanzania. Not only do they pop up in, in cities, in multiple cities, but they make multiple visits to non-home cities. So we see people, you know, the people from sparsely populated areas that we observe in our data, again, it's a slightly weird sampling of people from sparsely populated areas, but they make multiple visits to distant cities. And I think that's really interesting in thinking about spatial frictions. It's hard to square that with the idea that the cost of a bus ticket is keeping people from moving. And I'm going to argue in a minute or two that it's also hard to square that with information frictions that people simply don't know what the cities are like or what surrounding cities and towns are like. We're seeing people from these sparsely populated areas showing up for multiple visits, going back and forth to different cities. Um, and so this, I think, is telling us something really important about the kinds of frictions that might be salient and the kinds that might be less salient in our countries. Um, I'm checking in on time here. I'm conscious that I probably ought to be wrapping up. Um, Robert, to allow. So let me skip very briefly through this. We can look at who pops up in different locations and Without spending a lot of time on this, I'll just say for Nigeria, what we see is that everybody visits Lagos to, to um, exaggerate. People go disproportionately to the biggest city in all three of our countries. Lots of people go to the, to the largest city, to Lagos, to Nairobi, to Dar, relatively modest flows between secondary cities. We, we don't see nearly as many people going and people whose home locations are in Kaduna or Ibadan or Kano um, tend overall to visit either Lagos or Abuja. They don't visit other secondary cities that are close by. Um, 
let me, in the interest of time, not spend, not try to summarize this. Um, let me very briefly just touch on a couple of things. I already referenced the gravity equations that we run. I won't spend time on this except to say when we run a gravity estimation on our, for instance, our travel between cities, we find that um, we get coefficients on the gravity, on the distance that suggest a cost of distance that is quite consistent with what we see in many other estimates from different parts of the world. So distance does matter. There are, there are variable costs of movement that are relating, um, that are relevant here for where people go. But we also see, if you pull out these destination fixed effects and ask what goes into those destination fixed effects, what you see is that the, the attractiveness of these cities as destinations closely related to city size and with the interesting kind of tweak that's a little unsurprising. So think of the destination fixed effect as a measure of the attractiveness of the city, very strongly related to city size. But you see here Abuja is showing up um, disproportionate to its size because it's the capital, because it's an administrative center. In all three countries, we see administrative centers showing up as, as being disproportionately attractive for their population size. So I won't dwell on that. Um, we've done the gravity estimates, different time dimensions and different spatial units, and I won't go into that in the interest of time. Let me just wrap up and say, um, I think the really key point that we want to make here is that we're seeing substantial mobility across space, frequent movement of people, people returning to the same locations multiple times. So this phenomenon of visits as distinct from either commuting or migration is something we haven't, I think, collectively thought much about. But the fact that it's so ubiquitous tells us something important to me about spatial frictions, which frictions we need to be thinking about as we try to understand whether and why gaps between locations remain and why they might persist. And so let me just stop there in the interest of opening things up for a few minutes of questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have just about four minutes or so. Um, so we'll probably take a couple of questions. Um, so I don't know whether we want to start with, um, there's a question from Tyron uh, asking how much cross-border mobility you can measure in the data. A great question, short answer. In principle, we think we might be able to track devices in the data across countries because the device identifier, we think in principle might be the same. We haven't yet tried to do that. Um, so I can't answer that question, but it's, an, it's something we've thought about and be really interesting to look at. Okay. So is there any other question? Okay, so there's a hand up. Margaret, oh, sorry, yes. I... Okay, uh, this is super interesting. So, but what's our reference point? Like, so what's the point of comparison? I guess, right. how to think about that. Yeah, we've thought about this and it's been asked before, what's the benchmark? What would this look like if we had a similar population of smartphone users in Germany or the UK or the US? Or, and so I guess my answer to that is I, I don't think we want to argue that there's something unusual or different about this. So I can't tell you that this is high mobility or, or weirdly low mobility. I just say I think it's sufficient that we ought to be asking questions as we think about models with spatial frictions, trying to pin down what those frictions are and where we want to put them. It makes me want to think that modeling, modeling the cost of, of mobility across locations as a bus ticket probably isn't the right way to think about that for this context. Thinking about it as the cost. So I, I guess that's my answer is I don't know what the benchmark is, but I think of it more in terms of using these data to say something about the plausibility of different kinds of frictions being important as we go about trying to model to understand um, spatial frictions within within sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So are there any other last question? I don't see any hand. And I believe all the questions in the chat um, have been addressed. Well, I believe that uh, if 
people have uh, further questions, they can always touch base with Doug or Martina. And also Martina shared um, a link to the latest version of the um, paper um, in the chat. So those who are interested can always um, download it. So on that note, I would like to thank uh, Doug and um, Martina for the presentation and also thank all the participants uh, for the questions. So we'll break for 10 minutes and then we'll come for the next session at, I think, I believe it's six o'clock. Thank you. Thanks very much, Robert. Thanks.
Back to Booker, up top, Crowder. Richard Stakes now drives. Extra pass. Rick Baldwin with the terrific defense as well. But they're trying to draw the foul. So who's watching the football game? I, th I think it's basketball, uh, which, is, which is strange because I don't think anybody's playing. So this must be somebody watching a video. <laughs> Masai, are you uh, all set? I think we have about two minutes. Full kickoff minute. Can you see my screen? Okay. Slide. Yep. That, that's perfect. Um, okay, is it okay to kick off the this session? Uh, thank you all for uh, you know staying through this evening more uh, or day of the last uh, session. We're very pleased to have Messe Gibre Selassie. Uh, who will be presenting on roads extension and productivity. Uh, I'd like to at least, uh, you know, we're going to follow the same format. Uh, so please post your questions in the, uh, in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, and uh, get, um, say, you know, feel free to stop and ask questions if you need to. Uh, I will certainly uh, be keeping track of both the chat and the Q&A. Um, and I'd also like to ask folks if you can stay behind uh, at the end of this, uh, session. Uh, Robin has a short announcement about uh, future uh, 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 conferences. Okay, Mr. Uh, kick it off. All right. Thank you, James, and thank you to the organizers for including this paper in the program and for all of you for sticking to the, the last session. Uh, today, I'll talk to you about my paper on rural roads, agriculture extension, and, and, uh, and productivity. Mm -hmm. In most developing countries, low agricultural productivity continues to be a persistent challenge. For instance, you know, in 2017, agriculture accounted for about 60% of employment, but only 20% of GDP. At the same time, we see this limited adoption of potentially productivity uh, enhancing technologies. And the literature has looked at this puzzle and have identified several factors that could uh, help to, uh, uh, to improve agriculture, agricultural productivity. And two of these key factors were one, potentially improving access to technologies through programs such as farmer training or, or input subsidies. And then the other set of factors are, are, are essentially improving access to markets, either through improving rural uh, uh, road network or facilitating connections between different locations. And kind of the literature has looked at these, uh, the, these factors in isolation and often uh, the, the, um, the findings are essentially mixed in terms of their effectiveness and the evidence on the efficacy of each factor in isolation is mixed. Of course, rural communities face many interdependent constraints and that it may be important uh, that uh, we, need, we need to relax multiple constraints at a time, particularly if the effectiveness of you know, one type of intervention may depend on, on the other. So in this case in particular, I'm interested in to what extent is the effectiveness of improving access to markets through kind of improving uh, road networks or ac improving access to technologies through programs such as extension program. To what extent do the, the, you know, the effectiveness of one factor depend on, on the availability of the other? And uh, this is a difficult issue to, to study because you need two sources of variation. And in the context that I study here in, in Ethiopia, uh, it provides a unique opportunity to study these issues because there were two large scale programs, uh, the, the nationally implemented programs, one that essentially improved access to markets through uh, a, a large scale rural road construction program. And then another program that was uh, concurrently implemented that tried to improve access to technologies to farmers through expansion of extension. 
So in particular, since 2004, the Ethiopian government has been pushing for uh, uh, expanded access to agriculture extension, but with the aim of providing every village with training and subsidized access to training and subsidized inputs. And starting in 2011, uh, the government also had implemented a large scale rural road construction program under what's called the Universal Rural Road Access Program, very much similar to what India's uh, Prime Minister's road program is, which aimed to provide essentially every village in Ethiopia with, uh, with an all weather road. And what I try to do in this paper is essentially try to exploit the variations induced by these two large programs to study one. What's the effect of access to roads and extension on agricultural productivity, which is the kind of the main focus for, the, for this paper. And then importantly, are there important complementarities between access to roads and access to extensions that are that are facilitated uh, by this program. And uh, as, like Doug, I'm also in New England, so in case there is interruption, here are the previews of the results. Uh, I find that in isolation, access to road or extension have uh, limited to no effect on, on productivity. However, there are strong complementarities between access to roads and extension, in particular villages that have both a road and extension are about 6% more productive. And then looking into what, kind of what explains this, I find that uh, um, villages that have access to both roads and extension increase their use of advice or modern inputs such as chemical fertilizers and improved seeds. There's also the patterns of specialization in crop choices that are consistent with the, uh, uh, with the advantages provided with the extension program. And there's also some evidence of labor reallocation in response to those changes in, in access to markets and technologies. And kind of the summary takeaway is that while roads or extension uh, may increase farmers' in income on average, the gains are typically concentrated in the areas that have access to both, uh, which highlights the potential relevance of, uh, of relaxing this, these uh, interdependent constraints. Just to give you a sense of where the paper fits in, I think the key, the novel contribution of this paper is to my ability to study uh, uh, roads and expansions together to examine the, the, uh, the interaction between access to markets and technologies. Broadly, the paper fits in within three broad areas of the literature and many of you in this, in this Zoom session have contributed to this. The one area where I see it fitting is the literature on uh, agricultural productivity gap and the concurrent kind of barriers to technology adoption. Within that, I study two factors that may be critical for the adoption of, of technologies. And there's also burgeoning literature on the, um, the effect of rural integration on, uh, on agriculture outcomes. Within that, I study a, a large scale road expansion program. And there's also a, a, a continuing literature on, on the kind of the effectiveness of uh, extension programs. Within this, I examine in detail how extension affects um, um, agricultural outcomes using, using large um, uh, large uh, data sets. This is the roadmap for today's presentation. I'll give you some bit of background. We'll talk about the, the kind of the conceptual framework, and then I'll discuss the methodology and main results. Uh, uh, and then uh, if we have time, I'll delve a little bit into the mechanisms. So just to give you a little bit of background about the, the kind of the context, uh, the extension dates back in Ethiopia to the 1950s, but in recent years, there have been a concerted effort to expand farmers access to advice and inputs under the extension uh, uh, the extension program. In particular, the government aimed to provide in each, each village in Ethiopia with a farmer training center that's staffed with three extension agents, which sometimes are called development agents. Uh, and what you see here is the spatial distribution of, of farmer training centers or development agent offices uh, in 2007, uh, which is taken from uh, essentially the, the census that was undertaken then. and. In 2014, this is the distribution of the same kind of uh, set of facilities. So since 2004, the government has established over 15,000 farmer training cent uh, centers, which is kind of uh, highlights how large scale uh, um, this program was. And, um, and so what do these agents do or do these extension agents do? This is essentially the typical, uh, the breakdown of a development agent's work time or this extension agent's work time. Um, so when you think of extension in this context, it's really more than just the, pro the provision of advice because the extension agents are engaged not only visiting farmers uh, uh, in their homes or fields to provide them with training on, on modern technical inputs, but they also have a role in mobilizing the community for things like uh, 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 waterworks. They also play a role in facilitating farmers access to inputs uh, and credit. Uh, in some cases, they also play a role in kind of administrative uh, tasks within, within, within the village. Uh, 
But uh, so extension in this sense is a combination of provision of information as well as uh, uh, provision of access to subsidized inputs and, and credit or facilitation of, the, of that access. And concurrent with kind of the expansion of, of the rollout of the, uh, um, the farmer training centers that I highlighted earlier, you see a concurrent increase in the share of, of farmers who are participating in the extension program. This figure shows you the share of area that's under extension. I have data, the data on this from 2007 onwards, as you can see, it's been increasing over this period. Um, the extension program mainly focused on cereals, about 80% of the area under extension is essentially for, uh, for cereals, which are the, the main grain uh, uh, um, groups for, for, uh, within Ethiopian agriculture. On the other hand, as I said, uh, starting in 2011, there's also been another push to uh, improve the connectivity of rural uh, areas within Ethiopia. So in particular, under the Universal Rural Road Access Program, the government aimed to provide every village in Ethiopia with, a, with an all-weather road. Uh, what you see here is the road network in 2010, which mainly consisted of essentially uh, uh, federal or regional roads. And a lot of the rural communities that are within reach of, of this, uh, the, this uh, main roads were not connected to them. And essentially Europe, this program was trying to connect these villages to the existing road networks. And by 2014, what you see here in color, essentially is the set of roads that have been, uh, that, that were built under this program. And Europe accounts for a, a significant component of the recent expansion uh, of, the, of the road network. And what I try to do in this paper is essentially try to exploit this variation. Now, these are not fancy roads. Often they're essentially gravel roads that could be serviceable during an all-weather road, so uh, during uh, uh, all seasons. This is uh, one example of a road that was built under, uh, under this program. I'm, I'm not, uh, James, are there questions that I may need to address? Uh, not so far. I've, uh, one question in the Q&A, but uh, no, no, no other questions so far. So uh, carry on. Sure. And so, um, as I said, the, the, under the Europe program, essentially the government aimed to connect villages that are within a certain distance from the existing road network. So what you see here, the dots are essentially the locations of villages. Uh, and what you see in black are the, is the road network that existed in, in 2010. And in 2011, you see the set of roads that were essentially where construction started. Most essentially tried to connect the villages that are near the existing roads uh, uh, to the main uh, to the main arteries, uh, and these are the roads that were built or start, where construction started in 2012, which most of them again build on the roads that were built in 2012 to connect essentially more remote more remote areas. Uh, you know this is where you see in 2013, and we where you see in 2014, which is the 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 the, the last year for which I have data. So in essence, what determined the rollout was essentially. Uh, the proximity of a particular village to the existing road network, and then the cost of, uh, of connecting them to the existing road network, which I will try to exploit in, in, in uh, one of the identification strategies. So how should we think of, kind of the effect of, uh, of roads and, uh, and expansion and extension? This is uh, admittedly a very simple framework, just to set in kind of have a, a general idea of how to think about this. The extension program is essentially improving access to technology to, to farmers, whereas the, the Europe program is improving market access by reducing uh, the uh, trade costs. Why should we expect there to be complementarities between the two? Um, for a village that has extension, that has access to these technologies, access to a road may expand market opportunities that incentivize the take up of uh, of, of the technologies that are provided under extension, right? These are typically risky technologies that are costly technologies. And if farmers don't see the potential profits that could be gained from, from ad adopting these technologies, it may be hard to, 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 uh, to have them adopt these. And for a village that has extension, access to road complements it by making it, uh, 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 by increasing market opportunities that incentivize the take up of these technologies. Furthermore, it enables farmers to specialize in extension favorite crops instead of producing everything for themselves. Since they are connected, they can trade with other villages or other communities instead of having to produce a, a, you know, a, 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 a everything there. And this specialization to the extent that it aligns with their comparative advantage could be, could be potentially productivity enhancing. 
Furthermore, uh, in 2010, the government did, did, did a review of the extension program when one of the constraints they identified was was um, the poor road network that hindered the provision of extension. And so the, you know, the provision of road in this case or, or, or access to a road could facilitate the provision of extension to a larger group. On the other hand, for a village that has a road that has access to this market, extension allows farmers to have access to the know-how or the inputs that are needed to capitalize on these market opportunities. And furthermore, to the extent that connection exposes farmers to import competition, having access to information or inputs that are provided under the extension program may help them uh, or adapt to the, uh, the increased uh, import competition that they would face uh, from market integration. And so there could be potential complementarities between these two, uh, these two factors for these reasons. Let's say, let's say there's a question uh, from a panel. Uh, Margaret, you want to ask your question? Oh, uh, I'll try to be really quick. quick. Um, the question is, who builds the roads? And are they getting paid by the government? Are they locals or are they brought in from outside? And because that could increase demand for local products or it could increase incomes, which would also be affecting the same outcomes that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so I don't have detailed data to answer that more, more precisely, but typically, essentially, this program is managed by the regional governments who delegate who identify roads and then delegate that to either district uh, offices. Typically, they would have contractors uh, assigned to a particular road, and and uh, and those contractors may hire local uh, farmers to work on this on this uh, on this road construction. Uh, there's also sometimes a, a, a scheme where, uh, particularly in areas where farmers may be vulnerable, essentially uh, um, an agreement where they work on on this road construction. Uh, to help supplement their incomes potentially and uh, yes uh, uh, margaret as you pointed out I, I expect that this may have an effect on demand unfortunately i don't have the data to to say much about that in, in this context okay let's say just just one other question uh can you say something about the crop mix i mean i i assume that this is all teff and but you know it seems like farmers have a preference for something else and, so, yes. and can you also say something about what the costs are of either in time or money of uh, of getting goods from villages to the main road uh you know before and after the, the um, construction yes so for, for the most part as i said the extension um essentially was focused on the on on cereals improving productivity of cereals particularly teff and 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 maize which are also the main uh, uh cereal types that are grown uh, in, in this context um i don't have data unfortunately pre and post on in terms of transportation costs to say something specific about how that changed. I do have baseline data indicating what the potential cost is for transporting goods on, on different types of roads. Uh, typically they tend to be expensive. Again, in this context, before the Europe, the implementation of Europe, they essentially did not have access to any all weather road. And so it's hard to say something about like what the price prices were prior to, prior to the construction of this. Uh, this roads. Other question? Okay. So what do I do in this paper? So to examine kind of the potential interactions between the, these two factors, I essentially combine uh, ad detailed administrative data on the road network from the Ethiopian Road Authority, which I complemented with, uh, um, where I collected additional data from the four regional uh, road offices to look at essentially the timing of when this roads are built. Um, I, I do have data on the cost of construction for each road, but I haven't been able to, I have not incorporated that into the analysis yet, but that's something I would, I would love to look into in the future. I combine essentially this road network data with data on agricultural outcomes using the annual agricultural sample surveys that are undertaken by uh, the Central Statistical Agency, as well as surveys on household employment uh, and, and consumption. So if we look at the set of villages or enumeration areas that are included in the sample, essentially close, I have close to uh, um, 1700 uh, enumeration areas included in, in the baseline sample, and I'm able to follow them uh, from 2010 uh, onwards. There's significant spatial variation in the timing of road access across villages, as you can see here, uh, uh, the color indicates the year in which uh, Europe uh, uh, construction commenced. And I try to exploit essentially the variation and the timing of 
uh, of when villages get access to the road or extension to exploit or to identify the effect of having, you know, access, uh, having access to the road or extension or both. Of course, the key concern here is that the identification concern is that the placements of roads uh, or extension services is endogenous. Uh, unfortunately, there is no centralized treatment formula that I could use in, say, let's say, in, in a regression discontinuity framework. But what I know is that cost and regional budget constraints were uh, the key determinants of the rollout of, of, of the two programs from my conversations, both the policymakers who implemented the road and, and, and uh, the extension programs. In particular, if you look at the road program, this table is taken from uh, from the um, planning documents from the for the Europe program, where the government had laid out an annual road construction plan for each region. Um, so, for example, in the Tigray region, they wanted to build uh, 335 kilometers in the first year in 2011, uh, and then 515 kilometers, and so on. As you can see, essentially, particularly for the later years. At least the allocation across time is essentially a function of, of the budget constraints they have. The government had identified how many kilometers they would need to build to connect all the villages and essentially allocated a budget uh, equally, uh, uh, roughly equally uh, uh, across, uh, across the five years. And I'm going to use this in, in, uh, in uh, uh, one of the identification strategies. So, the identification strategy essentially exploits the variation in the timing of access to roads and, and extension using a two-way fixed effect specification where I, I look at outcomes such as mainly agri agricultural productivity and regress that on uh, whether a village has access to a Europe road or not in that year, whether it has access to extension or not, and then the key parameter of interest, which is the interaction of of access to a road under Europe and extension. And all the specifications include year and, and village fixed effects. Uh, and I also uh, uh, account flexibly for the, uh, included differential trends by baseline remoteness because the rollout of the two programs is correlated with remoteness to the baseline road network. And we may be concerned that there may be differential trends uh, by, uh, by this remoteness. And I cluster the standard areas at the district level because often roads are built that transverse uh, multiple villages uh, 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 with, within a district. Okay. So how okay, does this- just, say, just, just one mm -hmm. quick question. Um, yes. how, how should we think about the quality of extension uh, services in villages that don't have access to roads? I mean, you've talked about extension as advice and subsidies or inputs. And so, but should we think that you know villages that don't have access to roads are also not going to be able to provide inputs to the same degree as uh, you know road access villages? Exactly. So the road network would be playing a role not just in improving access to market, but also potentially facilitating the provision of of uh, advice or inputs that are provided under the extension. Um, unfortunately, I have a very rough measure of access to extension. I'm not able to observe the quality of the extension agents were available there, which I think is it would be important to the extent that connectivity may also determine who goes where, uh, but I'm limited in that sense. Uh, yeah. Other questions? And so how does the identification ad address the, the main concerns? So one of the concerns is that villages that are treated early may be different from those that are treated late, and the village fixed effect would account for any essentially time invariant characteristics that we may be concerned about. And furthermore, as I said, the rollout of Europe as well as the extension program is, is correlated with rem remoteness. And we may be concerned that there may be differential trends uh, between you know, areas or villages that are remote versus uh, close to the road network. And so the inclusion of this uh, differential trends by remoteness accounts for that. So the key identifying assumption is that essentially uh, the trends for those that are treated early and, and, and late are parallel or would have been parallel in the absence of uh, in the absence of treatment. And if you followed the kind of recent developments in Defendiv as well, in essence, I'm also assuming the effects are, are constant uh, between those that are treated early and late. And I'm hoping to incorporate some of that, um, to look into more of that in, 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 in um, further work. And I also examine to see if there's some validity to this parallel trends assumption by including uh, uh, an event study specification, which allows me to see if you know, the, uh, the pre-trends are at least parallel, which could be somewhat informative about the potential trends uh, uh, in the counterfactual case where there, there's no treatment. Um, 
Uh, and I also have alternative empirical strategies that try to add essentially different uh, information to kind of the, the baseline identification strategy. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about those later on, but essentially I try to incorporate a market access approach that takes into account the full red network. And I also have an, an IV strategy that takes into account or that tries to identify the variation um, that's purely due to exogenous factors that determine the rollout of, of the road network. Uh, and so here are the main results. Uh, as I said, the main outcome I'm interested in is how these factors affect agricultural productivity, which I measure using three variable, different variables here. One is essentially the production value per hectare at the, at the village level. And the second set I try to uh, incorporate for the uh, cost of things like inputs and, and, and proceeds, uh, which is the log value added per hectare uh, 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 variable. And then I also borrow a tool from the kind of uh, the IO literature and try to estimate TFP using the Levinson and Petrin approach. And across the three different sets of outcomes that try to capture some measure of productivity, what I find is that uh, particularly if you look at columns three, uh, six, and nine, that uh, the, you know, in isolation, access to a road or extension has no effect on productivity and the effects or the gains in productivity are essentially concentrated in the villages that have access to both road and extension. And, and the results imply that particularly looking at the value added per hectare outcome, villages with both a road and extension are about 6% more productive. And I try to examine uh, the pre-trends and the potential dynamic responses from these policies using the event study specific that I highlighted earlier. Um, the absence of pre-trends are, are, are provide some support for the identifying assumption. And furthermore, we see that, so this is showing you the effect of access to both road and extension on, on, um, on value added per hectare. You see that it takes some time for the effect to set in, which is consistent with the fact that it, you know, it, it takes time for farmers to adjust and respond to, respond to, uh, respond to this, these uh, changes in access to markets uh, and, uh, and technologies provided under the troop programs. Um, sorry, there was, a, there was a question which I missed a little bit earlier. I'm sorry, uh, Anani, I think, uh, asks and says, how do people use roads? Do they use bikes or cars? How is public transport expanded as roads are expanded? Uh, are they big enough for trucks that can carry produce? Yes, so typically these rural roads are essentially help um, either lorries or you know, small carts or uh, bajaj, I don't know what they're called in, in English, essentially small lorries. Uh, in some cases, they also service, they do service uh, tractors. The aim is, as I said, to provide essentially or build um, gravel roads that are accessible uh, uh, if, even during the, the, the rainy season. Um, but I don't have data to tell you specifically the changes in, in the types of transportation tools they use. But um, prior to the, the um, provision of these roads, essentially farmers have to resort to either carrying their produce or using animal such as donkeys to transport, uh, tra transport these goods. Um, my grandfather is actually uh, was a farmer and I'd gone there you know, several, several years ago and uh, there was no road that connected them to their nearest market. And I remember going with him and you know, essentially we had to load the, the grains on, 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 a, on a donkey and, and we took several hours to get to the market. And hopefully these types of roads are essentially trying to facilitate the entry of even small cars into these remote areas and connect them to kind of the existing arteries. So, so far I've used a, um, a dummy to capture essentially access to a road at an indicator variable, but some new roads may generate larger market access than others. And, uh, and to account for that, I essentially follow Donaldson and Hornbeck, and I use a red, reduced form expression for market access, which takes into account the full distribution of the road network and population. So in particular, I essentially for each village, I calculate the cost of, uh, of, tr of transport to all possible destinations. And then I sum up the population of all those possible destinations, weighing it by the trade cost, so the cost of getting there. And, uh, and with this, the advantage of this is that it exposes the full road, road network, it also captures treatment intensity rather than just using the indicator. And also uh, some you know, villages, even if they're not directly connected, their market access may increase because of connections elsewhere, which would be captured uh, in this approach. 
And so the way I do that is essentially here, you see the blue roads, which are the uh, Europe roads, and these are the dots are village centroids. For each village within two kilometers of a road, I connect it to that road, and then I copy the cost of getting to all possible locations, uh, and then I sum up the population of those uh, locations by, by weighing it with, with, the, uh, with the cost of getting there. And this gives you essentially a, 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 gives you uh, an intensity of, 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 of market access that's uh, which captures the in the fact that whether you're connected to a, you know a big or a capital or a town or a district town may be different than being connected to a village. So what you see here is this is Addis, and so villages that are connected close to Addis have of course higher market access, which is red, whereas those that are connected to smaller areas have uh, lower market access. And so I use this cap variable, this market access variable, instead of an indicator for having a road. And, uh, and I examine the same, I run the same set of, uh, of regressions that I showed you earlier, and the results are consistent. The, essentially, the gains in productivity are, are concentrated in the villages that have access to both extension and, 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 and improved market access to, due to this road network. So in particular, village in villages with, with extension, a one standard increase in market access results in about 4% uh, uh, improvements in, in productivity. Let's say uh, just one other clarification question uh, from Anthony. Um, it talks about, do you know anything about the quality of, especially not the new roads, but perhaps the existing network? Um, I don't know anything about the, the quality of the road network, but I know the type of road, road network, right? Whether it's a, a, a main regional road or whether it's a, you know, a, a, a federal road, and the cost of transport varies based on the road type, which I incorporate in the calculation of, of the market access measure. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I, I don't have data on the quality of, of, you know, of each type of road. Um, that would be something I think I would be valuable to incorporate if, 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 if available, but yeah. So I, and I complement, as I said, I complement the difference in different strategy within an IV strategy that tries to isolate the variation in the road network that's purely due to exogenous factors. Um, the main constraint on the road network expansion where essentially one is the regional budget constraint, which I showed you earlier in the table, in terms of how many kilometers each region was able to, or was assigned to, to construct in that year. Uh, baseline proximity, and then the cost implied by local terrain, so such as you know whether there's a river or the slope is, 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 you know, the area is more rugged or not, as well as potentially settlement patterns and other potential endogenous factor. What I try to do in this IV strategy is essentially try to identify the variation in the road network that's driven purely by the time invariant geographical factors, slope and river, and the baseline proximity and its interaction with the uh, with uh, budget con the regional budget constraints essentially. And what I try to do is I try to mirror what the civil uh, engineers were doing in terms of when they were planning which roads to build and how to build them. So what you what you see here is is the blue lines are essentially rivers. I just zoomed into a particular area in the country. Nothing. This isn't any, anywhere specific, but. What you see in blue are the rivers, what you see in black is the existing road network in, in 2010. And where you see the dots are essentially uh, um, a village centroid. And the color in the background is the slope. So the lighter it is, the more flat the terrain and the darker is, the, the higher is the, uh, the slope. And if you look at the road network, so the pink line here, what you see here is the road network that was built under the Eura program. And you can see how these constraints matter, particularly the slope and the presence of rivers, right? It's much cheaper to build roads on a flat terrain. It's very costly to build bridges. And so to think that's possible, essentially uh, the planners would avoid building, building uh, uh, bridges. You can see that here, for example, with these villages, you know, you, you would think it's closer to connect them to this net road network, uh, but essentially they're connected to uh, in location way farther, particularly because there is a river in between. And so what I try to do is essentially try to take into the cost of construction implied by this terrain, particularly the slope and, uh, and, and the, the location of rivers to build a road. So for each village, I take the first set of villages that are closest to the road network, the existing road network. And then I ask what's the cheapest way to connect them to the existing road network. 
what you see in green is is the road network that I predicted based on the based on the slope and and uh, and the presence of, of of rivers. And then I take the next set of villages and then try to again connect them to the this roads that I've built. Uh, and, and so which extends the road network. And then I do the same thing, take the next set of villages and build the road network. And it does sometimes remarkably remarkably well. Uh, you know, these were the, the the villages that I highlighted earlier, right? This process, in fact, does capture the fact that we're connecting them to this particular or this particular area rather than uh, uh, you know the, the this road in this section because there's a river in between. Uh, it does pretty well in some cases, but it's it's not perfect because the planners have taken a lot more into account when deciding how to build the roads. And in this case, I'm only taking into account the presence of the local terrain essentially. And, and so I create a predicted road, net, road network using this process. I first build the, I predict the full, road cost, full cost minimizing road network. And then in each year, I use the regional budgets that were set by the federal government to determine how much can be built within that region. And so this gives me an annual variation in the road network, right? Uh, and the predicted road, road network that takes into account only the, the regional budgets and, uh, and the costs implied by the local terrain. And then I use that predicted market access. So I use that network to calculate the market access in the same way I, I, I did before. And then I use that as an IV for the actual market access. And so this is the result. So the first two columns are uh, the OLS results from that I showed you earlier. And then the last two columns are the IV results where I essentially instrument for the actual market access using the predicted market access that I predicted based on the, the topography and regional uh, budget constraints. The, the first stage is pretty strong, uh, which you, you, uh, you can see from the, the, uh, the map that I showed earlier, because essentially topography and regional budget constraints are a significant determinant of, of, of the rollout. And comparing the results, uh, the IV results across the board are essentially consistent with the main OLS findings, which is that uh, that the, it's the villages that have access to both extension and, uh, and access to market facility with, with this roads that actually benefit from improvements in, in productivity. Um, and so I look at mechanisms that help to explain uh, uh, these results. What I find is that, and villages both with a road and extension, farmers are a lot more likely to, uh, to use advice that's provided on the extension program and uh, adopt modern inputs. Since we have time, I think I'll, I'll show you some of this. So in particular, I, I look at whether farmers use any advice. Again, this is at the individual level, whether they use chemical fertilizers. So the share of cultivated area that's an, uh, cultivated under using chemical fertilizers, improved seeds, herbicides, and across the board, what we see is that uh, that you know villages that have access to both road and the extension are more likely to use uh, to use these modern inputs. And so the complementarity between access to roads and extension arises by facilitating uh, the the, the uh, use of or adoption of these modern inputs. I also find patterns that are uh, uh, where the farmers are specializing in crops that's consistent with the provision of uh, of extension. As I said earlier, the extension program favored cereals uh, and farmers in villages that are connected without extension shift out of cereals, whereas those in villages that have access to both extension and road, they, they, they uh, increase cultivation of, uh, of cereals. So um, cereals are, are account for about 65% of cultivated area and then 85% you know, of the area under, under uh, extension and within cereals, 35% of the cultivated area is under this extension package, which you see here, uh, blue is for cereals and, and the other culture are for the other groups. You, you can see how the extension program has really focused on, on cereals. And this is what I was highlighting earlier. Uh, when we look at crop choices, in particular, the share of area cultivated for cereals and the villages that have both access to road and extension, they're more likely to grow cereals, whereas it's the opposite in the villages that are connected uh, without uh, without access to this uh, extension. And I also find patterns of, of trade that are consistent with these patterns of specialization in, in, in crop choices. I don't have you know, great data on trade, but what I do in this in this um, analysis is essentially use the household survey data on, on production and consumption to see 
the ratio of production and consumption by crop groups. So for example, within cereals, okay, how much of the consumption essentially comes from production. Uh, and then I could do the same for pulses and oils. So if you look at column two, for example, villages that are connected with extension, okay, are less likely to produce pulses relative to what they, what they consume, right? Whereas it's the opposite in the villages that are connected with the road. Um, there are similar patterns for cereals. You, you see here that essentially in the villages with both the road and extension, where farmers are specializing in, in cereal cultivation, they produce more cereals than they consume, which suggests that these trade patterns may be consistent uh, with the patterns of, of, uh, of crop choice. And there's also some evidence of, uh, of um, household shifting um, uh, their labor across different sectors and villages with only a road. Uh, we see that household shift out of agriculture. So look at essentially here, uh, column three, six, and eight, where I look at the, you know, whether a household is within the agriculture sector, manufacturing, mining, or other, uh, other sectors. We see that in the villages that are connected with the extension, essentially they, you know, they are, uh, they're more likely to be in agriculture or, or they're more likely to be in, within the skilled agriculture group, whereas they are more likely to shift out of skilled agriculture into other sectors. Uh, in the villages that are connected with a road, but they don't have access to extension. And this is perhaps reflective of the fact that the, the, you know, the villages that are, have the road, but they don't have extension, they, they're essentially at a comparative disadvantage relative to those villages that also have access to extension and the kind of this, uh, uh, the technologies and inputs that are provided under, under uh, the extension program. And overall, looking at kind of the overall effects of of these two programs, essentially, I find that excuse me, um, consistent with the results that I've shown you earlier, log value added performance, the average essentially average income performance is, is, is much higher for villages with that have access to road, road and extension, whereas it's lower in, in, in the uh, villages that only have access to a road. Uh, but there's also, uh, as I showed earlier, this is consistent with the shift in labor across different sectors, essentially the villages that are connected without extension, they're shifting out of agriculture. And so their agriculture income is, is likely to, uh, to be lower. And so the gains in uh, productivity from uh, the provision of these two programs are really concentrated in the villages that have both access to uh, the road and the extension programs. So there's a question from the panel. Uh, Andy, do you want, you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. So I'm just uh, I'm I'm kind of interested in what happened to sort of farm gate prices because you could imagine the effect of extensions being both ways, right? That you know on the one hand it sort of floods the market, pushing down prices. On the other hand, um, it could if there are sort of uh, cost uh, scale economies in terms of transport or increased competition among transporters, uh, the prices could be more favorable. Any sense of that? I I am looking into this. So I, the analysis I've so far does not include that, but that's. Uh... That's on the list of looking at local prices, essentially. Yeah, that, I think that would be valuable. The patterns of trade do indicate that there will be potentially movements in prices, uh, given that farmers are specializing in crops in response to these changes. And uh, but yeah, that I don't have the results on that. Other questions? So to summarize, um, access to road extension have limited effects on productivity, but I find that there are really strong complementarities between these two factors. And uh, looking to the mechanisms, I find that villages that have access to both the road and extension are more likely to use the advice that's provided in the extension, and they're more likely to adopt modern inputs. And furthermore, there are patterns of specialization in crop choices that are consistent uh, with the advantages that are that's provided in the, under the extension program. And there's also some evidence of labor reallocation across sectors, in particular in villages that only have a road, they're shifting out of agriculture into, you know, uh, into the, other, uh, the other sectors. And the results highlight the potential gains that policymakers could, could, could uh, uh, accrue by leveraging the complementarities on the rollout of these two programs. But of course, it is also contingent on kind of uh, cost benefit analysis that takes into account the, the, the cost of implementing these both of these policies at the same time. And uh, kind of to address Andy's points, I'm looking at crop utilization to see if 
farmers are more likely to sell cereals in the villages that have access to uh, uh, both the road and extension and then looking at local prices as well, how they respond to these changes. That's it. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, we have a few minutes uh, and I'm going to start, you know, as folks uh, think about questions, please raise your hand or type in the chat. Uh, but I guess I didn't do justice to Anthony's earlier question. So let me read it out. I, uh, he has another question, which has to do with um, the frequency of cases where roads uh, with bridges have been budgeted and funded, but have not, uh, where bridges have not been built. Uh, and is that, you know, do you have any data uh, uh, on that. And I think he says uh, this uh, many theories can explain cost overruns in public infrastructure spend, but I think it's mostly on the fact that there may be connections uh, that are not quite complete. Yes, that's, that's a great question. Um, I don't have the data to answer that, but uh, I agree with the fact that sometimes there are a lot of cost overruns or incompletion of projects that are started. In the analysis, I actually, I don't, I, what I do is I only take into account the year when construction started, and I don't take into account whether the road is uh, necessarily completed or not, at least in, this, in the simple case, partly because whether a road is completed or not is going to be endogenous, right? To the extent that it reflects local uh, uh, factors that may also have an effect on agriculture outcomes, that may be a concern if I only look at the roads that are completed or not. So. I essentially look at the, take the year in which the construction of the road started. Uh, and then I, I, I impute that after two years, which is the average year in which some of the roads are completed as those roads being completed. Uh, but that would be something I, I think that would be interesting to do is, is to, uh, which I, I've been thinking about is, is using satellite data uh, in conjunction with the road plans to see if indeed the roads that were said to be built are actually being built. And, uh, and there's some work, recent work that, that's trying to use satellite data to measure road quality. So that would be another uh, interesting to do as well, to compare the road quality with, for example, the cost of, of the official cost of building those roads. And if they are, you know, if they're, they're, they're aligned. So. Mm -hmm. But that's not included in this analysis. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Robin? Yeah, I'm, oh. just, I'm, I'm just wondering about um, subsistence. I presume that the kind of story here is kind of movement out of subsistence, you know, either through agricultural extension or transport costs going down. Um, but how do you deal with people who are consuming a lot of what they produce? Uh, how, how you, you know, so the sh you know, if you don't actually get into the market, how you, you know, because once you get into the market, obviously incomes will look like they go up because now you're selling that stuff you used to consume. Yeah. How do you deal with that issue? So the main outcome that I'm looking at, for example, production per, per hectare, that's all production. That's not necessarily production for the market. So that takes into account whether it's for own consumption or for the market. Uh, and so I, I'm agnostic about which dimension is being expanded. Uh, but that's the, one of the last things I mentioned is using, looking at crop utilization, which could say something about that. Um, I, have, I have some evidence showing that essentially the sale, the share of cereals that's sold is higher in the villages that are connected with the road and extension. And so there you see some shift towards market production, even for cereals. Uh, but the, the results that I've shown you so far essentially are agnostic about that. It's just looking at production that could be used for own consumption or, uh, or um, for, for sale, but they're valued at the mar using market prices. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions? Uh, if, if they're not, I'd like to thank Masse for a great presentation uh, and like to hand over to Robin for uh, some your closing remarks. Thank you, everyone. Robin, over to you. Hi, thank you. Um,
Sorry, um, I just wanted to thank everyone for staying on. I know it's late in Africa. Um, and also just to mention a couple of things, which particularly for those of you who don't know Brad very well, the first is that this is the first time we've done a, a conference focused on a region. Uh, and I think it's been successful and um, so thank you for all coming and presenting. We had over 300 papers submitted, which is around what you get in a regular bread conference. Uh, so it, it shows the kind of the, the volume and quality of work that's now going on uh, on Africa. Um, and I think the other thing just to, to kind of also reflect on is that the pandemic has been bad in, in many, many ways, <laughs> but it has been good in terms of opening up access to conferences. And I think the, um, the next bread conferences, which are going to be, uh, there's going to be a full one joint with the MBR and then one at Northwestern in the spring and then one joint with CPR in the fall of next year. Um, those I think will all be accessible. So if you send an email to that email at the top, we're not already part of bread, um, then you will get all the kind of calls for papers that we'd love to see uh, more people coming and submitting and so forth. And then the second uh, web address is, in, is the website of uh, Bread, where you can see all the working papers and announcement for conferences and many other things, uh, which was recently redesigned by Tavni, so thank you. And then the final thing is, as of the fall, Bread will be working with CPR on a, a virtual development economics seminar organizing uh, that. And you can now already register for that. So this is uh, online. So you know, two to two to five hundred people show up every two weeks to look at presentations of papers by development economists. So the whole sort of purpose of Brad is to promote research um, and scholarship in development economics. And since many of you, judging from the submissions, I haven't seen in other submissions to Brad conferences, I'd love people to sort of um, continue to take part by joining in, submitting papers, going to, to these types of activities. And then finally, I wanted to say a particular thanks to Chris Udry because he was really the person that inspired me to organize this. We originally thought of doing it in person, but I think in many ways doing it virtually has been really more inclusive in terms of getting lots and lots of people to come along. And last but not least, uh, all the members of the organizing committee who are there, we not only that through, you know, reading 60 papers or so, but also uh, came in and moderated uh, and chaired all the, all the sessions. So th thank you to, to you all. And also the four organizations that sort of put this together, the, um, with BRED, the African School of Economics, African Economic Research Con Consortium, Northwest and IGC, not just because it's been a lot of work, but also because they were particularly powerful in getting the call for papers and out to a much, much broader audience, which meant that the, hence a large number of submissions uh, from uh, many people who have not participated in bread uh, conferences uh, uh, before. Anyway, I will not hold you back from whatever stage of the day you're in, but uh, thank you everyone. And we hope to see you at future bread events. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robin, for driving this. Have a good evening or morning. Thank you. Thank you.